so we're back in open session. We, just to review, uh, we weren't recording, but we convened at 11.30 and immediately went into the executive session just to uh, review our exercise that's coming up, and now we're back in open session. This is not being streamed live, it'll be rebroadcast later on, so that way one candidate can't get an advantage over another by watching the, uh, the live stream of the previous person. Um, so a quick overview of how we got here. Municipal Resources Inc. was hired as a contractor. Uh, they advertised the town administrator position, collected resumes, and performed an initial screening process on 49 applications for the position. Uh, this search committee uh, was initially screened 13 of those final, semi-finalist resumes. Um, we also looked at a writing sample, and we chose to bring six people in for in-person interviews that lasted about an hour each. Uh, these are our three finalists that we have here today. What we're going to be doing is a job simulation. They are going to act as though they are the town administrator and conducting a department head meeting. And the select board has uh, given them a directive that they are to open restaurants here in the town of Hadley after the COVID-19 uh, issues. So um, for everyone that's watching, unfortunately we can't let you ask questions of individual candidates because they have to be Ask of each person, so everything's all the same. Um, but you're here to observe and uh, take, take a look at your future administrator. Maybe. So um, each candidate will have about 20 minutes to do their exercise, and then the search committee will ask any final interview questions. It may be about something that we saw in the resume, the writing sample, something that came up as a follow up from a past interview, um, really about anything. So I'd like to have Buzz from uh, Municipal Resources give a quick rundown of the information provided to the candidates uh, regarding the simulation. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Buzz Statchinsky. I'm with Municipal Resources Inc. And we were uh, very fortunate to get the engagement of, of helping Hattie find its next uh, town administrator. And uh, we have three candidates today. I'll introduce them individually. Uh, but we have three candidates today that have uh, considerable municipal experience, all of them. The town's website has all three of them. On the town's website, you can see their, their uh, letter, their resume that was attached, and then the essay questions. We ask them to respond to three essay questions. Uh, about the municipality, and they all did that, and uh, so that's all online. Now, for today's exercise, we asked them to look at, uh, excuse me, we asked them to uh, come into a staff meeting. They are the town administrators. They are the town administrator. They're going to sit there. They're going to come into a staff meeting, and they're going to develop a plan to open restaurants. I'll just read it. So we sent them all this uh, uh, last week. You were tasked last night by the select board to coordinate the reopening of all restaurants in Hadley as fast as possible. Revenue is down. Many business owners are anxious to open amidst the uh, COVID-19. The town as a whole wants to see its economy up and running. So as a guide, we sent them to the state's website, mass.gov, on opening of restaurants. They, we said use that and conduct a meeting with department heads to develop a process for the businesses to interact with the town, remove many barriers, as many barriers as possible, and develop a plan to bring back to the select board so that the opening could take place on Friday, July 17th. And at the meeting, as, uh, the, the Board of Health, Inspections, Council on Aging, Superintendent of Schools, the Treasurer Collector, and uh, Fire EMS are here. Uh, this isn't, they're all playing different roles, they're playing roles of the department heads, and they're the staff for the town to assist the town administrator coming back with a plan that he or she will present to the select board. Anything else, uh, Mr. Chairman? No. Okay. May I introduce? All right. Our first 
Kennedy is Tom Bruno. Tom is uh, a longtime municipal manager, uh, 14 years as a town administrator in Bourne, Massachusetts. He spent several years as the uh, director of the Massachusetts, I'm going to get this right, uh, the uh, Massachusetts Rural Development Council, nine years, and he's been an interim manager and an interim administrator in a number of communities. So, uh, Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, folks, uh, and thanks for coming in on short notice, and I do apologize that I'm taking your lunch hour from today. Um, if any of you watched the select board meeting or have heard through the rumor mill over the past 24 hours, the board is very anxious um, to move into the phase two um, governor's uh, guidances on opening restaurants, um, both from an in inside where we can and certainly from an outside uh, outside seating perspective. I want to go over with you before I ask for your uh, ideas and comments and concerns, because I know that there's some of those with each of you. I want to go over perhaps some of the things that we know. And then I want to tell you what I'm going to send you that will help you in developing your piece of the plan before we get back together to finally put the whole piece together to present to the board next week. Um, that is our timetable, that is our deadline, and we need to get on it. Um, so let's talk about briefly what we do know. Uh, we do know that there's significant guidance um, through the COVID website and what the governor and the Department of Health and others have put forward. We know that the enforcement of some of these is going to be challenging. You know, we want to talk about how outside seating is going to take place. What are some of the regulatory obstacles that we're going to be looking at? Um, what are some of the public safety issues that we're going to be looking at? How we're going to protect patrons as well as people driving in those areas on outside? What are the occupancy issues that we're going to have to deal with? If we put outside seating in, is that going to have an impact on their overall seating capacity. If it reaches 99 people and the building isn't sprinkled, how do we address that? Um, how do we deal with liquor licenses uh, that are on premise or in premise? ABCC has provided some guidance on that, but there is some question as to whether the select board has to take a blanket action to allow this type of activity to occur outside the licensed premise. And how are the departments, how are you folks going to be able to handle what's going on? How's the health department going to be able to handle this? How's the inspection department going to be able to handle this? From the fire department perspective, how are you going to look at these uh, occupancy issues and deal with that? What is the municipal liability? Uh, I've asked council to provide guidance on the municipal liability for any of the outside uh, dining. Uh, will we charge fees? Is that something that we're going to ask the select board to consider given the additional work that's being put forward? Um, and what are the citizens' concerns on this? Uh, we're going to have seniors that are concerned about going outside, people with pre-existing conditions are going to have concerns with this. How are we going to address that? So I want to open it up for more of an environmental scan today on what you folks see as the major issues that we can then, because we don't have time today to put the plan together. We're not going to put a plan together in, in a half an hour. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll get the biggest concerns put out there and then we will meet uh, day after tomorrow and we will hopefully together finish putting a plan together that we can present to the select board in their packets for the next two years. Uh, I will send to you a draft application that I have prepared um, for the town of Haddon for outside seating, um, uh, a contract that will have to be passed by council uh, relative to waiver of liability 
to the town for any of the outside seating that takes place within the public right of way. Um, a, a pretty good opinion that has been rendered by KP Law um, that we can use as a template for our council um, and ask he or she for that. Um, and I will also again give you the websites that are available through the Commonwealth for, for your um, review as we put this thing together. What I need from you today, uh, and I want to listen and try to get interactive, are what are your concerns and how are we going to address them? So I'm going to open it up. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad that you were able to get here today, uh, but I really want this to be interactive. I just wanted to set the guidelines. So with that, Chief. Thank you. Uh, just probably, uh, one of the top concerns for us right now, I'm sure there's others that will come up, but the biggest one is with these all these expansions, a lot of the businesses that are contacting us are looking to expand into parking lots, uh, right away as we see it, and the fire department has some serious concerns on the existing footprints as they are regarding fire lanes, fire access, and just looking for guidance from the town administration as to how far we're going to go and what kind of fire we're at. We're hopefully not going to be violating any of the Chapter 148 fire laws in regards to access by the fire department. The second question and issue is with this increased number of inspections, uh, we're concerned. We only have two full-time firefighters on during the day, plus the deputy and myself. And the number of inspections that we have coming in really are going to need to have additional staff come in and do not have a very substantial overtime budget. And just want to know if that would be supported by town administrative administration as well. Okay. I'm going to take everyone's concerns and then we'll try to have an interactive on how to address them. Okay. Uh, as uh, Acting as inspections today, uh, my concern is very similar to the fire chiefs, except uh, rather than the exterior of the, uh, the establishments, the railways, and the people outside. Uh, we know that the, the governor's directive does allow for interior seating as well. Um, that presents a very similar personnel issue. Uh, the fire chief just expressed for our inspections department to be able to ensure that. Uh, the seating is appropriate and by guidelines. Um, and also, uh, egresses and things like that um, are going to have to be uh, inspected with uh, fire chief and, and uh, emergency management. So we're concerned about those uh, couple of issues as well that we're going to have to undertake and we just do not have people to do it. I want to follow up with that. I do I want to get to everyone. But why would the egress situation, as you see, be different from the an interior restaurant that's already an interior restaurant? Well, it, it's mainly because of the fact that there's going to be exterior seating. Okay. Uh, that kind of changes things as far as where servers are going to be able to walk and move, uh, whether or not egress is going to be blocked, things like that. All right, thank you. We're worried about our seniors and wondering if there's any way to have special senior hours like the grocery stores do for the restaurants, where people with the finished immune system or the elderly uh, would have access without being out in the huge crowds. That is a good question. Thank you. From Board of Health, I think that the uh, select board is making a mistake here by opening up. I think that uh, this is not safe to be doing at this point. And that we're putting not only the employees' lives at risk, but also citizens' lives at risk by uh, allowing these restaurants to, to open up at this point. So let me come back to you on that in just a minute, okay? Well, unlike the Board of Health, I'm actually, as a treasurer collector, I'm very pleased and welcome the news that the uh, restaurants will be opening and for obvious reasons. But I also feel that, in light of the fact that restaurants, even with their plans in place, are not going to be able to be at 100% of their pre-COVID capacity. And also, we don't have about 35,000 college students and associated employees in this area right now. And so, I don't know if you've given any thought as to the decline in revenues that the town of Hampton is going to receive as to how that's going to affect both this year's ongoing budget, but also budgeting for next year. Okay. Well, 
So thanks for calling us all together today to talk about this, and uh, this doesn't directly affect the schools, but I'm always curious about the extent to which we have and we are planning to do a cost-benefit analysis. So are we projecting the degree to which we anticipate revenues will increase by implementing, uh, entering this next phase against the costs that uh, public safety pointed out in terms of human resources, time, and actual expenses. And related to that, I'm curious about our communication plan with the community at large, how we communicate what we're doing, why we decided it made, it, it made sense to do this, the um, guidance that we're depending on to make this determination, and do we have any plan of setting metrics in place in advance to say um, we're, we're prepared to look for unintended consequences of this decision and to change course if necessary. Thank you. Um, let me get to the health department first, and I'm going to come back to the Council on Aging Issues. The, it's not an issue of whether it's we can or we can't, or it's a good idea or a bad idea. It is, it is authorized to do that right now, and I realize there's some local decision making involved with it. Um, there is a cost-benefit analysis, there's a return on investment for these businesses that get to, to the treasurer's point too. A lot of these restaurants may not even bother um, if they can't turn the seats around uh, quick enough to make it worth their while. 50% or 25% occupancy is not going to be worth their while. There's going to be areas where they're not able to get outside seating that they set. So I don't think you're going to see a huge um, clamoring at the door for, for all of these places to get open. This is something that the select board has said we need to do. They want to get it done. So the question of, I understand the concerns, and we're going to have to keep a good eye on that, but it's something that we're going to do. And we're going to have to work around that and work with the health department and work with those concerns, but we're going to move forward with this, and we're going to try to address all of those things that we brought forward. Relative to the treasurer, um, you know, it's about $100,000 a quarter that you're, you have in your rooms and meals occupancy. So all of this is going to be very difficult, especially looking into FY22. One of the, I think, the concerns and one of the problems that came up, and I'm going to ask you if you agree, um, is when the CARES Act came forward, there was no mechanism for us to be able to use, utilize some of that those dollars and the lost revenues that the municipalities had. That's going to put an awful strain on FY22 more than I think FY21. Um, I, I think that's where our problem is in. Relative to the Council on Aging, I'm going to get to you folks and then ask for your input again. Relative to the COA, a lot of the restaurants already offer um, early bird type dining, uh, if you will, and perhaps that is something we can suggest. We cannot force that, uh, but we certainly can ask those restaurants to consider the vulnerable populations. It's not just the seniors. It's, it's with other people with pre-existing conditions or, um, you know, health issues that are scary to them to come out into mass public gatherings. And we'll work with that as we put this together. I hope that'll be a recommendation for the select board. On the fire, um, specifically in some of the inspections, we cannot allow public safety to be jeopardized. Turning radiuses, getting access to if, if they're if it's at the mall and they're outside spigots, I call them, that's not what they are, for you folks to get at. We cannot jeopardize that. And where, where as much as public safety is concerned, that takes precedent over perhaps how these folks are able to open. Relative to both of your concerns um, on the dollars um, and adding extra staff, and we're going to have to, I think inspections will probably need to uh, either ask another community to help on a regional basis to do that, and perhaps some of your 
neighboring communities will be able to offer you additional staff. They're going to have to be paid. I mean, no one's doing these things for free. One of the first things I would do is look to the, the current reserve fund, ask for a reserve fund transfer. I know it's really early in the fiscal year to do that. Um, and try to supplement your overtime budgets to help with that. I would also put this in on our application for any funding that we look at through, through the CARES Act in an effort on the reopening of this. Um, and I think that may be something that they, they would consider. But certainly, if it's twenty-five dollars or $30,000, whatever the case may be, we look to the reserve fund. We'll have a special town meeting where we know that we're going to need a special town meeting just because of the way the numbers are going to be coming in. And we'll have to ask the town meeting to make a transfer either from the stabilization of the reserve fund to make you whole. We understand that. Um, relative to metrics, um, that's going to be difficult, uh, but we would look to the state uh, to help us in the regional office of DPA so we can see how those things are working. Um, relative to communication, uh, we have a number of different ways to communicate now. You have the website, you have Facebook pages, the police and fire, I'm sure have, you know, they can utilize their own Facebook page. Uh, we can tweet out things that are happening. Um, as much as I don't like using Twitter for a number of reasons, but that is one way that we can get the word out as well. Um, if we find that there are problematic stores, I'm going to look to the public safety chiefs and the health department to bring that to my attention immediately and under the statutes as the health department has uh, separate from what the select board may or may not be able to do. I expect the health agent and the health board uh, to be sure that if something needs to be closed, they do that. What do you need from me before we get together on Friday to put this together so we can put a plan in place and select what do we need to the next year? What do you need from me? You know, I don't agree with it, but I guess we'll just go along in the process. So, you know, tell the board of health what you what you need from us, what boxes we need to check, and we'll, we'll chip in. No matter what we do, uh, in some sectors of the population, we are going to be not popular uh, on any way that we go forward. We do need to get back to some sort of normalcy. I don't know what that is, and I don't know what that will look like a week from now, three weeks from now. Uh, we all have to work on this together. I need you to bring those impediments that you see to the meeting on Friday. I also need you to bring a plan of how your department is going to implement this so that we can attach it. So when the select board sees the document, the information, they're going to have all the pieces that they need to make an intelligent decision. Um, if the health board has real concerns, I suggest any of them come to the select board and make those concerns known. This is not a, it's not a thief though, if you will. I want your input, the select board wants your input. Um, and I'm, I would like to know what that is before you get there. Uh, because there's nothing, no one wants us to be caught blind. We certainly will not be prohibited from bringing your concerns forward. Anything else? Who took the notice? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we can't do my go around the room today and find out what's going on in the department. We don't have time, and I didn't bring the Tootsie Rolls, and I apologize for that. We always have a Tootsie Roll pop winner at the, at, at the department head meetings if you're aware of. So how do you win? It depends. Generally, if it's the police chief, it's who can be the quietest and longest. Um, <laughs> and those that generally don't participate, if we can extract some participation from them, uh, perhaps they'll win. 
Uh, do you need any, is there any other questions that you might have? Because I, I, I kind of droned on a little bit today, but there's a lot of information we need to get assembled between now and Friday. We're at 20 minutes to just wrap up for the simulation. Okay. Um, please have it to me electronically by 9.30 Friday morning. I will have it back to you by 1 o'clock, so if you plan to take the day off, please keep your email up and available that you can review it. Uh, I, will part, I, I will send it to the board uh, by day's end on Friday so they have time to review it um, for the Tuesday's meeting. Thanks for coming in. I'm sorry to ruin your lunch. Um, and you know, I know that we'll be able to pull this off because you folks always are able to pull things off that seem to be impossible at the time. And we appreciate it. All right. So. That's the simulation for now, and then we'll go back to uh, final interview questions. Do you want to start with the start from this side, or which, which side do you want to start with? You're still working. Okay. Does anybody have any problems? I got a couple. Which, uh, someone doesn't. You should go first. All right. So. What are your thoughts on how to handle the capital? How do you find those requests? <coughs> Excuse me. There's nothing worse than being hit at the budget season with a capital request that hasn't been on the plans for a while. Um, generally speaking, there should be a capital plan in place that has non-emergency issues. Uh, replacement and new purchase schedules. You have, much of the capital is going to be relative to what your debt is and how that can be rolled over. Is something coming off and something coming back on to try to keep it even? Do you have a capital stabilization fund that can fund some of these if you're putting a little bit aside each year? Let's say it's a new fire truck at $800,000. You probably don't want to borrow for that entire $800,000. Is there a dedicated fund of twenty-five or fifty thousand dollars a year over a twenty-year period, where but interest and other um, uh, regulatory requirements that they come on that you don't know about at the time, and you're able to help fund that? One of the things that we uh, I have done in the past is uh, if it's not on the schedule and it's not an emergency, it doesn't go forward, and that makes the department heads. Uh, really have to pre-plan some of their expenses. Um, you know, if something, if you lose your loader in the middle of the year and you have to go out and do something to lease it uh, for a period of time, you can go back to special town meeting and then work with the select board with the finance department and how we're going to be able to get this done. Keep going. Or yeah. yeah, I got two more, but let's, let's let you go. All right. <laughs> we have some of our uh, greatest financial minds in the, uh, the audience today. So I was wondering if in about two or three minutes, you could explain it very well during the last meeting, but in about two or three minutes, you could explain to everyone what your ideas of uh, priority-based funding is. I can't say good morning in two or three minutes, Chief, but I'll, I'll, I'll try. Give it a uh, no. Priority-based budgeting is a different way of looking at your operational budget. It doesn't eliminate the line item budget that the town's people and the select board and the finance committee see. But what it does do is break down all of the activities that your department uses, save schools, because they are to do that kind of thing, um, into programs or tasks. Um, so recreation may have seven or eight different programs and help may have seven or eight different programs and tasks that they do. Uh, police have tasks more than programs. Um, and you look at them in a quadrant perspective, the top quadrant being those things that are absolutely required by state or federal statute that you have to do. The second tier of that is um, those things that the municipality has indicated it it is to be done by bylaw or ordinance. So they're required. 
The third quadrant goes into, uh, we call it nice to have, but they may be priorities for your community. Um, recreation, um, library, um, those types of programs. Now, they're not just nice to have, they're, they're, they're necessary in communities. They're the great equalizer for all income brackets and all socio strata areas. So they're not necessarily nice to have in the way that you can dispose of them, but they're not required by statute. You look at all of those and you see what, if there may be duplication. There, you can see we started to do this 15 years ago and we've had this program every year. Uh, DARE is a, maybe a program that you don't use anymore, but you're still funding it and there's no kids being involved with it anymore. Is there a private sector or another public sector organization that's doing that you can partner up with? I won't get into the yoga class again. I won't get into it because it'll take longer than three minutes. But there are ways to look at what you're doing. The, the initial work on priority-based budgeting is a lot. And you're asking a lot of the, uh, the accountant, not so much the treasurer's office, but the accountant's office and the departments to really pick, pick it apart. There are templates, it goes into a spreadsheet, and the key is to maintain it, just like you would the capital plan every year. I, I find it to be a really good tool to use. Tom, from where you said, what do you view as the number one single issue facing the town happening today? There are seven number one issues that are facing the town. I think that the growth issues in housing affordability. I think they tie them together. Um, I think those are probably key. The agricultural community is so important in the ability to keep that vibrant while there's pressure on those folks to sell it, um, at a pretty decent profit. What are we able to do to help with that? But, uh, you know, traffic is, is, there's a bunch, but I think probably growth in housing would be your biggest, your biggest concerns. Can you uh, say a little bit about this? Um, I mean, you talk about priority based budgeting, but if you think of the budget as a resource allocation strategy and the resources that we're using are tax dollars, right? So how do you, what are some of the ways that you think about measuring the return on investment for the taxpayer, for business owners? What's the return on investment? What are some of the ways that you measure and express that quantitatively and qualitatively? So in some departments, it's very simple. Uh, how many participants in the program? Uh, what is the participation rate then over time? Um, if it's a fee-based system, um, is are the fees being charged sufficient to cover the cost? Both are pretty simple. When you get into metrics on policing or fire EMS, the metrics become a little more difficult because the priorities on a daily basis change. But you can certainly look at you can look at number of calls that come in, a number of ones that come in, and those types of things, that really doesn't answer what the, those departments are necessarily doing. Um, so the way I, I guess I look at that is through the goals that are set up for each department, um, and those benchmarks that you set up for each of the department leaders, if those are being achieved, and there's buy-in to those, there has to be buy-in too. Uh, then you have some measurement on what the return is. If those are not being achieved, then either the goal is incorrect or the way it was set up was not appropriate. Or an impediment came in that really threw it off its tilt. We need to figure out what that is and make adjustments. 
When you deal in municipal, uh, there's always grants and other things that you can try to get, but you really deal with a zero-sum game. There's X amount of money in the pot that has to be distributed appropriately to the departments. Some years, you know, if you set up your, your, your priorities right, some years it may be the police department needs three more patrol officers, or they need a, a detective sergeant or something. You don't do that in, in the first year. You have to build toward that uh, and, and be able to sustain it. And the key is, is you know, don't use one-time expenditures, one-time revenues for long-term expenditures. Uh, you have to plan and you have, you know, maybe the police one year, two years down the road, the treasurer's office may want to, uh, the finance department may want to get rid of this terrible Bayer system that we're using, and I don't know if you use Bayer. Um, it's great for treasurer collector, uh, but from a from a budgeting perspective, I find it just awful, awful, awful tool, awful. <laughs> um, um, you know, but if, you know, if you're going to change over to Munis, or if you're going to change over to Softright, or one of the other, um, then that's a, not only a capital. The capital in dollars, that's a capital investment of staff time. And you have to be prepared to ramp up to that. Okay, I have one. So, Hanley has one of the lowest tax rates in the area. And many of our residents feel really strongly that it should stay that way and don't want any new taxes. They're not willing to acknowledge inflation is happening everywhere. How do you deal with that? You try to bring in additional tax base if you can, but you have to continue that balance as I spoke about earlier of protecting those things that are so dear and make happy happy. Okay, each town has its own rhythm. Um, there is a time, and you know, I don't like paying more for my electric bill every month uh, either. And at some point, they put a they put a rate increase on you. And, it has to be, if the town is going to stay current and be able to provide the services that the seniors or the rec or the library or public safety or the schools demand, things can't stay stagnant. Sometimes two and a half percent just isn't enough to do that. And if you're going to look for additional tax revenue from the people that are paying the bills, then one better have it well documented, well planned, well presented, and make the case. If you don't make a good case that's cogent and makes sense and shows what you will lose, then you're not going to move, you're not going to get that additional level. If you were chosen as the next town administrator, how would you be transparent on, on two fronts with your employees and also with the council? I think there's some similar answer to that, and this is a little different answer, but the similar answer is you give where it's appropriate. Well, to the department, uh, as long as it's not dealing with personnel related matters. The same information at the same time, so everybody's in the same boat on things that are municipally wide related. Now, there may be some times where the treasurer's office is dealing with health insurance related issues. And uh, HIPAA related issues, and, you know, payroll deduction related issues. Uh, those types of things have to be between the treasurer's office and the administrator where it's appropriate for even the administrator to know all those types of things. But you try, you know, you communicate via email, uh, which I, I am old, a little gray in the gill. If it's a really important thing, if you're working with me, don't tell me you sent me an email seven weeks ago um, at 3.17 in the afternoon, because if you're getting 150 emails a day, 
it, you know, sometimes you, you really need a business and you don't triage them right. You know, print it off and bring it to me that it's important. That's when I know that you really need business. Relative to transparency with the, um, with the citizenry, um, it's really kind of the same thing. Make sure that information that is necessary and required to be in the public realm is put out there in as many formats as you can, and in, in, in multilingual if necessary. Um, be ready to go to the Kiwanis meeting or the early morning Rotary Club meeting or the PTO meeting um, or a school committee meeting, a, you know, that type of thing. Be ready to be public, be ready to be accessible on a Saturday afternoon if that's when the sports parents are meeting uh, on something and you want to get something out like additional revenue, you know, set up some time and do that. Um, I am not a huge, I said this in the last interview, I don't always believe that um, social media is necessarily the best place to put things, but certainly your website is some place to put things. And there may be appropriate websites to record the leads of fire or uh, treasure if you're having you know, if there's a benefit program to be internally. But externally, you need to immerse yourself and you need to get out with those constituencies. Uh, to be sure that the word is being spread. So, I'll put on my second head as works in integer. Um, so, public information is, is critical in police, fire, public safety. Um, so, getting a consistent message out. As the emergency manager, my, my role is to uh, chair the select board and make sure that he has all the information. However, the town administrator acts as I just wondered, wanted to ask what your experience is with creating consistent messaging and how you ensure that all department heads are together so that one consistent message is set I can answer this question. Um, being on the Cape, we were hit frequently with a number of storm related issues, winter storms or worse than summer storms, obviously. But, um, we were also hit when Katrina came in with an influx of refugee folks from um, the south that needed housing and they offered joint bases in Cod. Um, there were all kinds of you know, citizen concerns and rumors running about that. We brought the, e the, the EMD and the EOC uh, emergency management director and the emergency operations committee together. Um, we met frequently. We put out press releases. We, I all, often use the chief of police because he had um, both, of them, all three of the chiefs had great public respect. So we used, and I'm sure the fire chief does too. But I mean that. But we used the, the, the we used the fire, the police chief to put forth some, even though I was the PIO, things were better sometimes heard from the police chief than they were from the higher health of people. And he was a local, so that made, that made a big difference. Um, getting the information to me, everything has to, and I don't mean it, it has to be, there has to be a problem. And the information has to funnel in to a point person who then distributes it to the chair and the rest of the board. The chair of the board, although he or she may have that role, which is to run the meetings and to help set the agenda and do those types of things, they have no more um, right, if you will, to information than any other member of the board. So when it filters down, it goes out to everyone. My last question for you, and this was, this is obviously in your resume and whatnot, but for the viewers, how many employees in the past have you been directly responsible for in previous positions and what sorts of, what size of budgets over the years? Well, I've, I've worked with budgets of as little as 500,000, uh, going back to the days of Warwick and Wendell, um, to budgets of 70 plus million. Um, 
number of employees has varied, uh, but in Bourne, in addition to the, at the time, 14 or 15 direct reports and department heads, department leaders, because there was no super departments, uh, uh, although we were working on that. Um, you know, direct reports were about 8, 17, 18. Uh, then there was municipal office staff in the select board and the town administrator's office. Um, I expected the department leaders to take care of their own staff, if you will, relative to the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, but when it all came comes down, there were about 230 uh, employees, not including school, that I dealt with directly. There were times when employees would come in to me with a not a departmental problem, um, but they maybe have something going on at home, um, and I certainly always kept that door open and always understood that if you want a good, productive workforce, you have to take into consideration there is a home life, and that sometimes home life isn't always uh, unicorns and wild uh, Any final questions? Well, thank you very much. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Tom, for having me to both rounds. Thank you. All right, we'll get started on interview number two. Thanks. Hello, I'd like to introduce Joshua Garcia. Joshua is the top administrator in Blanford. Not too far from here, he served there several years, and he was also uh, five years in municipal uh, uh, coordinator at the at the. Uh, at the Pioneer Valley Planning Council. I present Joshua. Hello, Thanks for having me. So we got about 20 minutes uh, for the simulation exercise. And so as of now, you're the administrator and more your department heads. All right, great. Well, hello everybody. Thanks for coming in uh, short notice. I know that everybody is extremely busy. Uh, so just so you hear it directly from me, just please know how greatly appreciative I am for you uh, being in such a short notice. Uh, I know there's a million other things we could be doing right now. Uh, you have another meeting or another COVID meeting at that, but on the flip side, it's not another Zoom meeting. We're here in person, so. Um, first, what I want to do, just to let you know, the select board, the reason why we call this meeting is because they're very interested in us proceeding with coming up with a plan to uh, uh, open up our restaurants, to make sure that we have a two-way partnership, clear communication between our restaurants, our local government, so they can open up quickly, safely, uh, as possible. But before we go into that, I uh, just want to know, we do only have 20 minutes. I don't expect for us to develop this plan. Uh, within the 20 minutes that we have right now. But what I want to do is go over what the goal is. Um, uh, I also want to hear quickly uh, from the Board of Health on where we are when it comes to COVID. The Board of Health is here. Thanks. Um, where we are when it comes to COVID, especially as it's aligned between our local government and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts plan for the, 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 uh, the opening of, of uh, the different establishments within the Commonwealth. Uh, spend a few minutes and going on some, going over some concerns uh, that might, you know, you've experienced in, uh, through previous phases. Uh, what went well, what didn't go well, and uh, what is it that we can do better, especially with me in this position, how can I help you more in um, supporting your effort and doing what it is that you do to make sure that we're having a much more uh, effective and efficient process forward. And then after that, um, uh, I'm going to assign you a task. And what I want to do is meet 48 hours from today, hopefully Friday. Um, 48 hours from today is Friday. Uh, and uh, we'll go over that when we get there. Does that sound like a plan? Is there any questions before we dive right in? Everyone comfortable? 
So the goal really coordinate the reopening of all restaurants. Uh, the select board specifically asked that we develop a process for businesses to interact with town, remove any barriers that we can, and present a plan to the select board. Uh, they're looking for an implementation plan by Friday, specifically why I'm happy the Board of Health has been able to join us, and if, if we can hear where we are with the Commonwealth, and just to make sure that that's a realistic goal and that it's aligned. I know that everyone wants to open up the economy. I know that businesses are itching to open. But certainly we have uh, leadership coming from the Department of Public Health and the Governor's Office, and I don't want to uh, step aside uh, from, uh, you know, I, I want to make sure that we're aligned with, with those efforts. So if we can just briefly. Sure, so we've been following the Governor's guidance throughout this uh, pandemic, um, but just as far as opening restaurants go, uh, our position on the Board of Health is that the select board is making the wrong decision here and that uh, by opening the restaurants or opening anything really, uh, we're putting employees at risk and uh, the, the public at risk and we shouldn't be taking this sort of gamble with people's lives. I think that that's a very uh, valid perspective. Does anyone uh, agree or disagree uh, with what's been shared here before I know, as far as well, uh, as the uh, public code of this town, I do disagree with the Board of Health. I'm actually very pleased that we hear that we are opening restaurants. Uh, people will be able to go out again and enjoy their meals, which they haven't been able to do for the last several months. However, uh, despite the fact that they're opening, I know that these restaurants will be able to be at 100% capacity. That's issue number one. But issue number two is that as you well know, this area has about 35,000 students and their associated employees, and they're, they're not here. So they're not going to be taking the revenues that they, do, that they were before, and that's going to trickle down to our town and county's uh, meal stacks. And I just would like to know, you know what kind of plans you have in place for the budget for this year, but also the upcoming. No, I think uh, I think that's also a very valid concern. And um, here's what I want to do: with, let me know if you're okay with this. Uh, um, let's go through this after this meeting. Let's get together and have a much, you know, deeper dive into the conversation about, you know, uh, about you know, if we succeed with moving forward, or if we don't, what plan can we put together to ensure that we're meeting budgetary gaps moving uh, uh, forward? depending on what decisions made. Um, is that, can you park that for a moment? Because what I want to do is, so you're, you're, you're saying that there's a clear concern, but what I want to know is, as far as the governor's plan, if we were to open, implement a plan by next week, Friday, let's say, with the select board that requested, are we against, um, are we within or are in line with the phase and approach? Um, yeah, I mean, we can, we can certainly follow uh, the governor's mm -hmm. guidance, so we don't agree with it, but uh, and we think it's a mistake, but we can certainly follow that and do whatever he does to do to get the pressure on the Okay. So, um, so the reason, so I, I think there's a clear reason, you know, you're saying that it's a mistake, but uh, what has been the experiences or for what challenges have we experienced um, during previous reopening phases from other entities um, as far as the data is concerned? So, on the fire department side, you know, we've been asked to, uh, we've been getting a lot of requests from the restaurants to expand the footprint of the restaurants so that they can have people sitting outside. Uh, the fire department has just, we have some concerns on these footprints because they're starting to compete on fire lanes, uh, outside egress pathways, and uh, we just want to make sure that they're not uh, jeopardizing our ability to get in and out of the space. And we just want to know what uh, the select board, that they understand we can't violate mass general law uh, under fire laws for, for allowing restaurants to expand into the park. The other part is with all of these case inspections that need to be done to ensure that everything is safe. Uh, we, we don't, we have uh, four full time firefighters on board today, and our plate is already full. Just concerned about the need to have additional staff to assist with the 
assist with uh, the additional inspections that are needed to get these places open. And we have a very small overtime budget. We just want to make sure that uh, the select board understands that we're going to need support on it. Okay. And I know that certainly there's you know there's been some best practice improvement around you know very uh, things you, you've uh, mentioned. One thing I, I want you to know. I know there's budgetary concerns around whether or not we can or can't have the capacity to. But let's focus on, uh, and again, we don't have to accomplish today, but part of the task that I want you guys to do we can in 48 hours is to uh, uh, jot, jot down the various strategies that we can make a list. There's no end to it. The various strategies uh, you think we can implement as a best practice uh, to navigate the very concerns that I'm hearing from the Board of Health. Um, uh, but also uh, support, if, if we're in line, you know, the governor's recommendations, we're, we're certainly in our ability to open up restaurants. Um, let's do so, so that we're not, so that we can support our local businesses and not impact our, uh, you know, uh, the revenue of the community. Um, I think uh, we can certainly uh, navigate this issue and accommodate both concerns, uh, but for now, uh, if we can just, by Friday, after this meeting, come up with that list of as much strategies as possible. What we'll do is we'll reconvene, we'll go over those strategies, build some consensus on what works, what we can put to the side. Um, sleep on over the weekend, we need one more time next week, Monday, no later than Tuesday, uh, to go over uh, the final draft of this plan that essentially we'll present to the city. Um, uh, I hear the concern, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, we certainly want to make sure that as we proceed that we're not jeopardizing the health and safety of our community, of our businesses. Um, I think we can do that um, uh, using creative strategies that I've seen in other communities. Um, actually, just the other day, my wife and I had uh, lunch at, um, over the weekend, actually, at Northampton. And it's really neat what I saw uh, there as far as turning parking spaces into outdoor receiving, and they've been able to do it uh, within well thought out and planned safety protocols collaborating with the inspector department and so forth. So um, uh, the inspector, if we can, you know, jot down those strategies and, and even make notice of concerns about certain ideas, and, and I think that we can reconvene and, and hash that out. Can I get a time check as far as 20? How much, how much time do I have? For uh, time? Okay. Um, as far as so 10 minutes, that's great. As far as uh, previous reopening phases, what do we do well and where could we have been better? So when the supermarkets open, they have a special time for seniors in the morning throw. And I'm wondering if something with restaurants could be encouraged to happen for that because we as you know, have the most vulnerable population. The other thing that we're concerned about with seniors is like in Northampton, where they made all those parking spaces. We have seniors that don't walk well, and there's now nowhere for them to park in the mm -hmm. So it's a double-sided thing. It's just convenient to have people sitting there in the street, but there's no place to park. Very interesting point. I think, I mean, just broadly thinking here, Northampton has that congested downtown. It makes, I think, Hadley might have a, a much more Flexibility on, on navigating and making sure that if we were to proceed with such a creative plan, that our plan takes into consideration the ability for everybody, including our seniors, disabled or not, to access the restaurants that we're hearing. And I agree with that, absolutely. Um, I have a question that relates to inspections. Uh, and it kind of goes along with uh, what the fire chief was just saying. Uh, we can put together plan for you, you know, the bullet points of where it is that we're going to need, but I think uh, for, for the fire department as well as for inspection, what it really comes down to for us is having personnel and, uh, and uh, the finances, uh, if you will, uh, the support from you to ensure that we can get this job done, that we're going to have to inspect interior seating and exterior, make sure the addresses are in the right place, and set up the parking lots so that uh, you know, the seniors can, can access it appropriately. So I think we just need to know that there's no support where it is that we're going to be putting forward in these lists. 
So just before coming into this meeting, I did touch base briefly with the chair of the finance committee, and I do want to connect after this meeting because um, I think we, there, there's some, there's, we do have the ability to be able to uh, navigate available resources to make sure that you are at a really quick, um, uh, you know, through the, uh, you know, there's the, the funds made available for CARES Act, um, you know, we have funds uh, available in our, in our reserve. Um, so right now, let's focus on uh, you guys in your professional capacity going back to your departments, uh, identifying those gaps, what strategies can we implement, and what are the perceived barriers or gaps that are there currently that may not allow us to implement that. And uh, you know, we can take that and work together with the Chair of Finance, as well as our Treasurer Collector, and see uh, how we can navigate those available research to us to make sure we can do this. Um, I, just so you're aware, though, I, I'm not concerned. Um, I, uh, I, I, you know, through the CARES Act, there are some fun, a great deal of funds we can tap into, um, which is made available to us for any expense related to COVID-19 um, strategies that we can look at. Um, uh, if there's something that we need to uh, do so immediately, because those are later reimbursements, uh, I can certainly put in a request for the Department of Revenue and uh, do an emergency deficit spending. And we'll keep track of that and get it reimbursed for it and make sure that we're not losing anything as we proceed with the strategies you guys come up with. Does that sound? Yeah. Is that, if you have any questions, I know it's a little, that's what we worry about. Um, you know, it's, it's a little uh, complex. Um, but I think that, you know, that's what I'm here for. And we'll make sure that we get you the tools and the resources you need to ask too. I'm just wondering if, uh, thanks for asking us for our opinions and asking for our input. I'm just wondering if you or the select board be given consideration to laying out clearly the costs and risks versus the benefits of moving forward into the next phase versus the costs and benefits and risks of not moving forward. Have those been, I know you've asked for some input on this, but have you been thinking about it just like we're just quantifying that very specifically? And, if, and how would that be communicated to the public since there may be competing concerns? How would you communicate to the public the cost of acting and the cost of inaction? Yeah, so um, we've been taking a look at it, um, uh, you know, looking at possible being up to date on the, uh, the most recent uh, revenue reports and looking at where we are uh, within the fiscal year and, and uh, uh, trying to navigate any potential shortfalls. Um, uh, yes, short answer to you go looking at it. Not, not, um, uh, not everything is uh, uh, confirmed or set in stone yet. There's still some uncertainties ahead. Uh, but certainly, um, you know, the treasury collector and myself, the accountants, uh, uh, we've been meeting monthly and uh, not just talk about this particular issue, but um, you know, uh, an array of budget management uh, uh, responsibility to the town and uh, where we are in this year to ensure that we're on top of that as they, as they come up. I think part of our strategy does need to include a clear communication plan that our businesses as well as the residents, uh, whatever we do develop. Uh, when we go into the reopening of uh, these restaurants, uh, we haven't been as strong as we could have uh, to communicate where we are uh, financially uh, with these issues. And I think that that is something we can uh, uh, definitely uh, work on and make sure that we accomplish. Um, I know when it comes to the budget, it's very complex uh, for um, the average resident to, um, to, to understand, um, but I think that you know, as local officials, we should do the best we can to make sure that we're communicating that information um, as clearly as possible, so that you know, folks understand that we're working for them and that we're doing what we can to, to meet the needs of the community. But it's another uh, great question, and I think that that's just more than we need to work on. Um, we can always do better. And what do, you, what do you see as some of the components of an effective and clear communication plan? So what might that include when we're thinking about how we get this information out to businesses? 
I think that's an excellent question and one that I hope that we can talk more about on Friday. Um, so, you know, again, when I asked about creating this list, it's just a short period of time, 20 minutes, I know you're all busy. Uh, I don't want to take away from what it is that you guys are doing. Um, uh, but if you can work on that, uh, Superintendent McKenzie, uh, I apologize. Um, uh, and, and let's uh, let's uh, prepare to um, expand on that. <coughs> and even if we can uh, talk before that too, before the next meeting as well, just so they can um, be on the same page and, and make sure that you know, I'm coming up with that we're coming up with uh, clear solutions. Um, was I? Do, 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 so do we all know what the goal is and what we want to accomplish? What we're looking to do and select board to doing. I think I also hear that there are clear concerns on uh, if we're going to implement that we need to be uh, ideally board of health. Um, and certainly, we need to uh, make sure that we're taking those concerns into consideration, come up with solutions that will be up satisfactory to the recommendation or the concern of the board of health. Um, come up with uh, your ideas, identify the potential gaps within those ideas. And then we'll reconvene and go over that. Sounds like a plan. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that I miss or that anybody wants to go over briefly before we close the meeting? There we go. Thank you everybody for your time. You have my email, you have my cell phone number, text, call, email me anytime. Uh, we're gonna get through this and thank you everybody for the time and effort and professional capacity and what it is that you do and, and doing almost as impossible. So thank you. All right, so that ends the uh, job exercise. And so now we'll just have some uh, general questions that can be based on something people heard today or uh, based on your last interview resume and anything along those lines. Okay. So this is, you're no longer a time time trigger yet. You're, you're back to All right. Back to no, 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 no. <laughs> it's, yeah, I got to say, it's a very, I've never experienced this before. It's a very interesting process. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll start it off. Uh, how, if you're selected as the next time administrator, how how will you be transparent with your employees and the impact? So, that was a, in Blanford, that was a, a, one of a handful of concerns that, 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 um, that a couple of things that you have here, your, your transparency, um, you know, between the office, Office of the Select Board and the employees that work for the community, as well as uh, the office and the community at large. Um, there are tools available to me uh, that, that allow me to be as transparent as possible, depending on the, uh, the audience that I'm speaking with. Um, I, I do weekly updates um, with my uh, uh, the internal team of Town Hall at Blanford uh, by email. And also what I do is try to meet um, each of the employees, the volunteers, and where they are as far as communication is, is with them um, as well, because everyone has a different uh, way of, of uh, uh, getting information. <coughs> Some folks are not as good as using emails. Uh, other folks, um, you know, rather a phone call. Uh, it was difficult for me at Blanford to schedule regular department meetings because you're talking about the time with volunteers. So I never did I never organized the mandatory meetings because it's, you know if, if they're working for the town, they have a real job somewhere outside of town and they can't come in during the day to meet. So I try to understand where each of my employees are internally as far as communication is concerned and making sure that I'm using the tools available to me to ensure that the communication is getting um, as far as the public, again, um, there's a, 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 menu, a, a menu of different communication tools from, I know at Blanford, I, I have my own town administrator update this listserv that I do uh, every other week where I share the most latest and greatest coming out of my office, um, and I share it with the public, those that have um, subscribed uh, to the newsletter. Um, also, I know the Council on Aging has a, a their own communication method with their population, 22% of my population at Blanford is elderly. Um, uh, so I work directly with my council and agent directly to make sure that I'm tapping into, into uh, her communication tools so that that 
the information to get it, get it to um, the public. Um, so each, each department has their way of communicating information, um, and we do de maximize as much as possible to, to, to those tools. Um, it's, it's always difficult to get 100% of the information out there to everybody, um, but you do what you can with the tools available to you to ensure that the, the message is out there, depending on the audience you're speaking with. Um, would you be willing to give an hour a month on a regular schedule to me at the senior center and anybody could come in and ask questions from the public? Yeah, an hour a month at the senior center, an hour a month with the business community, an hour, you know, there's, there's a diverse set of uh, stakeholders. You have the business community, um, you know, you have your elderly population, um, you have your youth population, you have Different groups and organizations, nonprofit entities, I'm sure. Um, uh, and, you know, part of the select board's objective is to make sure that they're representative of uh, every corner of the town uh, within the municipal boundaries. Um, you know, I'm working in the direction of the select board, and I want to make sure I'm the select board's volunteer board with their own personal lives. And here I am full time. It's not an eight hour a day job, it's, it's uh, 24 hour a day job, and I, 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 I'm pretty good at making myself flexible in any which way I can to make sure that I'm um, responding to constituent needs accordingly. Josh, in your perspective on the homework that you did, I imagine, what do you feel is the single most important issue facing the town of Well, this question was asked last time when I talked about the corridor. Um, all right, so my, 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 my biggest concern, and, and this is a conversation I had with when they say, are you sure you're ready to go to Adelaide? And <laughs> you have a small town, right, with 80 to 100,000 people within the town in any given day, every day, throughout the whole year. So you have a small town operating with a small budget with big city issues. And, uh, I think it's great that Hadley has um, one of the uh, lowest uh, tax rates in the area uh, throughout Massachusetts. Um, I'm, I'm sure you have a fire department that's trying to grow, a police department that's trying to grow. You know, um, more businesses and, and, and houses are, are being built. Um, you know, uh, how do we how do we make sure that you know as we continue to how do we make sure that we we can maintain those services and support that growth within the current tax rate. And I think the biggest community question here is, I mean, we've already tapped into a couple times um, free cash to fund operation. You know, that's usually a, a, not, a, not, not the best practice you want to uh, get into. But, you know, I think that's a, a sign right there that something different needs to happen. So the big question for the community is, you know, are you willing to um, Increase your, your tax rate to, to adequately meet the needs of the, of the local government. Um, that's not my decision to make. I hope to, um, you know, bring forward and under, have everyone understand the pros and cons on how we operate now and what we'll be doing differently with a different budget. And, um, you know, leverage whatever grant resource and other opportunities are out there to kind of offset that cost as much as you can. Um, I, I just don't think that you can continue to grow your community within the current uh, tax rate, depending on what your revenue looks like. I mean, the revenue is coming in and showing, you know, the, the rise in property values continue to increase. And you know, now there's another problem. There's the issue of affordability we have to talk about too, uh, for, for folks that are low income, which is a separate issue. So it's it's, it's a tough. It's a tough game to balance, um, and those are um, the discussions that we have to look out into the future and, and the discussions that you need to have. Make sure that you're positioning yourselves um, in preparation for those changes as they come. Does that make sense? Um, Ancient pipelines, if you will, for water and sewer. And 
funding for replacing them is practically non-existent. We also had an interesting interesting piece that uh, most of the path that's on the sewer is on the river down the corridor, and the rest of the path is separate, with a few exceptions. So how do you fund that? Yeah. And that's just that's a conversation we're having actually right now at number two. And you know, as we dive into that and, and prepare for that and try to mitigate resources and to effectively do some upgrades on the water lines and you know we have hydrants also that are um, inoperable because the, the pipes that they're connected are, are too small apparently, so they're not providing the necessary pressure um, on the fire department needs when they're responding to all the political cases. So uh, it's, it's not a unique challenge to have it. I think a lot of communities are facing that problem. And it's in line with, you know, again, with the revenues and what we have available to support our capital needs. Um, I know at Blanford, uh, we try to address some of the short-term things that we can do. Uh, well, we had to first reorganize our water department and get a much more stronger leadership uh, uh, capacity in, in that department. Uh, um, brought in some new commissioners, got a new um, water uh, superintendent. They have a healthy, relatively healthy uh, uh, stabilization for the enterprise account, the water department. Um, uh, so what we did was, you know, there were some immediate things that we saw that we can do with our own funds using a combination of um, what, what water had, their stabilization, a combination of, combination of what we have. We maintain a capital uh, projects line item um, that we use for um, whatever it is that we decided when we put the budget together that we want to use it for. And some of it is to do some water line upgrades and doing it by you know, a couple of uh, hundred feet or so at a time. That's something immediate uh, to, sh you know, to show that you, know, you are actively pursuing and planning and doing. Uh, some of the longer term objectives is to we have some debts that are retired at Blanford. Um, we also have a, uh, um, a special debt. Sorry, I'm drawing on it right now. Um, the special debt from, it's, 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 it's the tax rate only goes up for that special project. Remind me. Debt exclusion, thank you. Um, we'll slip it out. That are retiring soon. Um, so we have some, we see some flexibility coming up that we hope to uh, leverage that opportunity and then continue with that. Um, but also having a conversation with our uh, legislatures and, and area representatives. It, it, it's rumbling, it's discussion phase, but and, and who knows how cool they've impacted this. Uh, but we, you know, just like the Small Bridge uh, Replacement Program, trying to develop a program to help small towns um, and even larger communities depending on the, the need uh, and doing water infrastructure upgrades. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a conversation that you need to have with the state. It certainly knows a lot of to the aging infrastructure. I know that the commission knows about it. I know they try to do what they can in using community development block grants, but even that has its restrictions in terms of income eligibility. Those are the tools available to you, and, and we have to look at the big picture, right, and, and um, determine uh, our course of action, you know, how to navigate this issue with what's available to us. We sit around and do nothing. And now we're looking um, like uh, like you're like you're irresponsible. Um, so understanding the need, try to get a big picture of it, and then looking at the available resources to us, working together, coming up with a plan, and executing it for uh, some sort of a time frame. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. So Joshua, um, all of James' last question will allow you to talk a little bit about some of Abby's strengths. Uh, I tossed you a little bit of softball in here because you already had this question. And I wrote down that on my notes that I loved every part of your answer. Hopefully, you can replicate that before you start watching that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I know. How will your particular set of skills that you bring to the table uh, sort of mitigate some of the weaknesses that you see that Patty has and uh, build upon the strengths? So, so how do I see how to so perceive weaknesses that I see and how I can uh, work together with town to build on those weaknesses, turn them strengths. Right. 
So, uh, yeah, you know, every community does the best they can, right, within their capacity in which they were hired to do. Um, the, the individual for um, this role, it's a, I can't, those communities that operate with the town I don't know how they do it. Um, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, and uh, it's like a football team. I used this example last time. It's like a football team playing with no quarterback. Um, good one with that. Um, it, it's, it's uh, you know, you have your, your town measure that's able to kind of build that coalition, break down any barriers or any silos to kind of help um, strengthen the communication between the departments, the expectations, the, you know, what to the objectives we're trying to accomplish um, for the year or whatever the case went together. So, you know, there are folks. There are things that you might perceive as weaknesses. Um, I, it might not be that it's necessary. It's just probably because they don't have the support or guidance that they need. Right? We're not drawing from their strength as much as we can because there's a missing element, perhaps. I don't know if that's the case in how we maintain That's the situation because you guys know better what's happening internally than I do. I'm not in it yet. Um, so my immediate task when I step in, when I go in there is to understand the interoperability of the, of the local government. Um, you know, uh, I, I, starting around coming October, it's budget season for 22. I think that's the opportune moment um, to uh, work with each of the departments and get to know what it is that they do uh, in their community and, and understand what the gaps are and, and how, as we're putting this budget together, that's a reflection of uh, support for, for the needs of the community, right? That, you know, as I'm hearing and listening, that we're putting together a budget that helps kind of navigate those concerns and also ensure that cross-departmental coordination between departments is taking place as well. Um, uh, in case that, in case there is that feeling here, which I don't know if it's true or not, I know I hear a lot about it in local governments where um, we're having issues with departments communicating and, and collaborating and working together for whatever barrier that might exist. And then there becomes the perception that, you know, Government's not doing anything, or you know, this department's weak um, in, in carrying out their objectives. Maybe that's not the case. Maybe we're just not doing that good of a job in um, uh, facilitating uh, the efforts of what it is that, 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 they, that they think that needs to be accomplished. Um, I mean, I try to meet folks where they are. Um, Skill wise, I don't come up from the top down. I, I like to operate from the bottom up, middle up. Um, and, and do what I can to provide the necessary, be it the tools, the trainings, or whatever the case, so that the individual is, is empowered and is, is, is uh, growing um, uh, professionally for themselves as well and, and executing the needs of the department for the community. Um, I try to start there. And uh, if, if, if that's not working, eventually you, know, you have your personnel protocols in place to help mitigate whatever the concern is for an individual person that's not, um, you know, looking to, to, to the expectations for rule or whatever the case. Um, every circumstance is different. I'm just generally speaking. Um, I hope that answers you. Okay. What are your uh, thoughts on how to handle capital requests and how would you fund them? Yep. So, well, the good thing for this town, and it's something that, you know, it's kind of our next thing at plan to just come up with a capital um, uh, plan of some sort. We yeah. have, uh, and in that plan, I'm going to assume that when it was developed, it was it was developed with the consensus together with every department, right? Um, or was that not the case? Usually, when I develop a plan, right, I, it, it's inclusive of everybody's ideas, thoughts, concerns, or whatever the case. And the conclusion of the plan is, is uh, accepted from the large majority of the folks that help them together, right? So you have, and I'm assuming that that process did take place. Um, and in that plan identifies um, what it is you guys had essentially agreed to uh, fund for um, next year, the next two years, for the next 10 years, I think, is the 10 year capital plan. Um, and that might change depending on the available um, uh, revenue and, and you know what the, the community puts together for a budget for capital uh, related expenses and so forth. 
uh, we stick to the plan as much as you can. Um, in Blanford, uh, how, how we don't have a plan, so how we've been doing it is you know, I, I use my the uh, uh, the list. Uh, we have my insurance. They have their equipment list, all our buildings and, and vehicles on that list. I kind of use that as a baseline, and we look at that and see uh, where the uh, what the conditions are for each of those, and understand what the needs are for each. If it's a building, um, working together with um, my building guy and understanding, you know, what is it can we fix? Can I budget for more next year than the year after? You know, if something's going to go in five years, like the roof, for example, um, I think the town hall roof at Blackburn has another five years left before they have to. We'd be budgeting for that right now. Um, uh, taking a and, and, and all our capital has been funded using the available free cash for the town. The town has been producing a healthy, for a town of 1,200 people, they've been producing a healthy um, uh, level of uh, free cash by, you know, like, once it's certified, which has allowed for the, the, the greatest uh, flexibility allowed to them to do multiple equipment upgrades for the highway department. We did a lot of catch ups at Blanford. Um, uh, we're currently um, gearing up to purchase a property for the fire department, um, and uh, you know we've been um, working on uh, vehicle upgrades for our shared police department in town of Chester. Um, So I'm a resident in the community. I'm paying taxes. Um, I actually, I have a property. I live here. I'm paying taxes. I want to know what I'm getting in return and how I come from it. Yeah, as if, as if the time you're sharing with all of us, I would say this is this is your return on investment. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, that's wow, that's a really good question. Um, so. I don't want to pretend like I know the answer to the best. Because, uh, you know, the reality is, you know, when we're going through the, the, the budget process and, and um, you try to understand the, the, the needs of the communities within each of the government functions of, of, of the town, uh, you look at the available data um, being presented uh, to understand the area gaps. Um, you know, we you know, look at the overall health of the community sure that as a government we're responding to ensure that we're um, uh, improving, the, that we're doing the best we can to improve the quality of life uh, in our community. So you know, you look at all that and, and you put your budget accordingly based on expected revenues to, to kind of get you a step closer um, for, that, um, for that goal of improving the quality of life uh, in the community. Some of it is hard to quantify. Um, you know, there's different groups that have different desires and why they live here. Um, and if we're, I think I gave this example last time, right? So, in Blanford, 22% of the population uh, we learned was elderly. Um, transportation is a big problem in the rural community, yet alone in Western Mass in general. And we have an elderly population who grew up in Blanford, who was born in Blanford. And, and live there all their lives. Um, uh, it's it's not a you know some folks. So we wanted to. So we, we came to this conclusion that we want to purchase a or not purchase because you know when we started moving in that direction, someone actually donated uh, an SUV uh, to the council hall agent to put together a robust transportation service program out of our town hall uh, for our elderly population. That came with expenses. We still have to insure it. We still have to um, maintain it. We still have to gas it up, um, so forth. And, you know, there was the other concern. You know, we have volunteers um, that have this really neat, robust 
I'm really proud of what they've been able to accomplish to, to make sure that this program succeeds. But eventually those folks are going to go and there are going to be new folks and there's probably going to be a point where we're going to have to hire somebody to drive a vehicle and that comes with us. You have other folks that will say, you know, why, why don't you just move to Western, right? Where there's services and adequate transportation, you know, my taxpayer money going up, right? It's just one of those, you know, to other folks it's probably not as important and it's hard to quantify for them to, to understand why this is important for so again, we look at the overall health of the community and we work together to, to, to put together this budget to, to make sure that we're improving the quality of life for everybody. Um, and we try to communicate as much as possible on why these things are important, right? Um, uh, but, uh, you know, when you're reaching that conclusion and, and that communication and sharing that information, we have to make sure that us ourselves are doing our due diligence and we're looking at it inside and out to make sure that this is indeed not just a smoke and mirror, right? We want to be sure that we provide the adequate um, uh, information and data that we've collected that has ultimately came to that decision. So that um, folks may not agree with it, but understand on um, why it's a, a worthy investment. Um, and when you have a, a good quality of life here in Hamlet, right? People are going to want to move here, or always raise their family here, or even grow old here um, because of what it is that you're doing. And that's your that's your quantifiable data later on. What's long term, it's hard to quantify now. Like, if we do this now, we're going to get this. But how do we know that for sure? We had that issue when we we uh, hired, we, we established a regional economic development director. And each of the towns that participate in this regional program we created, we've, so, so we've built, baked it into our, our uh, budget. Right? So we, we've raised and appropriated to sustain that position. Well, you know, two years, three years has passed, and you know, it's, it's you, you can't quantify or, or if the, the goal is to achieve growth and, and to bring a new fact. That's 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 something that we hope to accomplish five to ten years from now that we can we can probably look back and say, hey, this was a worthy investment, but something we can't do right then and there. So that becomes a challenge, convincing people that this is a, a worthy investment for the community. Um, if, you're, if you're hiring a planet, right, do folks understand why that's important and where the investment is? You know, how do you quantify that? Um, I think that there's enough going on here to be able to communicate clearly on why it's important position. So it's a very difficult question to answer because it's a complex problem depending on what we're talking about. Chief. So I have to draw the walls over to the under part of the public safety. As the emergency manager, my responsibility to the chair of the select board and the select board for giving them information if we have a storm or a fire or, or something else in the community. Um, working with you as the town administrator, you also act as the TIO uh, public information officer for the community. And just your thoughts on consistent messaging and getting one message out that is clear and concise to uh, the community and the staff that work with them. Yep. So whatever comes out from my decision, it comes from emergency management, whatever it is that we're communicating out there, it's information that we um, confirm and agree to as an emergency management team. Um, uh, you know, issues rise, we'll be the emergency management group to coordinate and update these issues, and I know there's been moments in which we have to declare a state of emergency in the town. But that, you know, it's happened in all hours of, of the day. And then, you know, if we're talking about a major snowstorm that we didn't anticipate um, or, or had enough to, to tackle, but whatever the case is, we're all on the phone um, if it's the middle of the night. Um, if, it's, you know, if we're preparing for something that's taking place tomorrow for the weekend, you know, we're already meeting, getting together, and navigating the available resources to and see how I can support my emergency management. Um, personnel to ensure that they can effectively carry out the responsibility of the job. And whatever it is we're communicating, if that plan gets developed and shared. And if, if it's clear and concise and we're in agreement to it, then that, that, that's what goes out. Um, I know that there's, I mean, at Blackford, we have a 911 reverse 911 system uh, that we use regularly uh, for things like that. Um, again, there's that town administrator. Um, uh, Subscribe to the that I have. 
Um, there's our website uh, as well, and, and I make sure that whatever it is that we've agreed to put out there, that we're using all those communication tools and putting it out there accordingly, right? And, and that it's streamlined too. It's 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 difficult when you know if, if, when everyone's kind of operating in their own, and you have the fire department issues are coming up, and you're just sharing things on Facebook, right? Maybe have an internal policy and, and saying, hey, look, we're going to be sharing information that's 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 you know that's within the emergency management, right? Um, well, yet alone, I know there's other issues that come up like traffic jam with the accidents or whatever the case is. And we share that accordingly. We don't need to have an emergency management team meeting to share that information. But if we're talking about a severe weather storm, um, COVID, whatever the case, that the emergency management team together, I'm looking at you for the information. I'll frame it with whatever way we need to, and then we execute and put it out there. Any last questions? I got one more. Uh, in your current or past roles, what size of budgets have you been responsible for, and how many employees do you, you know, have you supervised or been responsible for? So, um, at the planning about the planning commission was was I believe the smallest. Um, you know, I, I managed the district local technical assistance program on the shared services at point. It was about, it was small, very small, 200, well, when I first started, it was $250,000. This is a, but you know, now that I've kind of been around this for as long as I've been involved, it's very small. Blanford is the largest budget I've managed. Um, uh, it's currently at uh, about 4.8 million. That doesn't include 500,000-ish uh, uh, for the water and price. Um, so that's the largest. Uh, oh, man, okay, please. Uh, so at Blanford, we've got eight full timers. Um, that's including myself, so seven full timers. Uh, four in the highway department, we're in the process of bringing in a fifth member. Um, uh, the fire the fire chief, um, and then he has, we have a volunteer fire department that we have a strong chief, former governor, he oversees the. Um, uh, the personnel in the department, but you know, I'm there to help guide and support more importantly uh, through any issues or concerns or, or whatever the case uh, might be. Um, we have the uh, well, we have the treasurer collector at this point. It's, it's, we contracted that service out because right now, again, it's the Blanford story, so we're doing a lot of catch up. We have to the town had to come to consensus and do some major investments to you know catch the community up as far as how they're funding and managing that treasure collector's office. Um, but I consider, you know, even though it's, it's, it's contracted out, I consider it's an employee of the town, right? And, and we oversee that, I oversee that contract. Um, as, well as, as well as the account, we have the same accounting team. And actually, I, I developed through my capacity at PBC, the regional accounting program that you guys just recently contracted for through the Kinsher CTA firm. And we have that in Blackford. Yeah, yeah, you know, they're, they're part of the team too. I look at them as employees. Uh, part time council on aging directors. I want to say it's like 15 to 20, um, both part time and full time, and that doesn't include volunteers. Um, and I look at my volunteers as easy to take Josh, that's all. I think it does. So, gateway assessment for Blanford. Is just under forty percent of the town budget. Um, it does. It does. Uh, I think it is. Last call. I know it says what's the budget here. Right? The base call. Twenty-one. Yeah, it's not four point eight million. But yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming in. And, uh, thanks for your time. All right, thanks for having everybody. Yeah, thank you. I go around and shake everybody. All right, if everybody's ready, we'll get started. And, Bud, if you want to come on in.
Hello, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to present Karen Brennan. Karen is now the uh, Executive Director of the Council on Aging in East Long Meadow, where she's been for 15 years, and prior to that, uh, 13 years as the Director of the COA in Hampton, and she's also served as a co-director in uh, Amherst before that. Karen Brennan. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> So the first portion here, you are now the Town Administrator of Holly, and we are your department heads. And, uh, it looks like we're going to be on the Yes, i fight it. So go ahead and take over, and uh, we just have the department head meeting to accomplish your goal. Great. Well, thank you. It's good to see everybody again, and with you. So, I thank you for taking the time. I know you had a busy schedule and a busy day to meet with me. Last night, the Board of Selectmen uh, gave you the charge to put a plan together to help reopen the restaurants in Hackley. Um, I am confident it is an aggressive uh, date, July 17th, but I am confident that with all the skills here, we can do that and present a really good recommendation that the Board of Selectmen would be happy to support. So what I'd like to do, I, I think first the priorities will be that um, we want to keep the patrons safe uh, that are attending the restaurants and, and happy, as well as helping the, uh, the restaurants open, especially our smaller local independent restaurants, to be able to do it easily, effectively, and have our support. So I'm sure that uh, you all got a chance to read the COVID guidance that the government has given. And I would like to um, use that as our guideline. Um, but I'd like to take this time to, if I could ask each of you to give about a minute, if you can, that would be difficult for me to do to explain something. But if you could just take a minute and explain, after reading the COVID guidance from the governor, what, um, what part of that would you take responsibility for to help with this plan that we can present to the board select? Um, a minute would be great because we only have 20 minutes. But a part of that is if you can just tell me what your responsibility would be, what your concern would be, and then how myself as the town administrator can support you with that and other people here at the table. Um, so I would like to start with Board of Health. I think it's the building block right now. So if you could just share with it. So our responsibility would be just making sure that these businesses are compliant with the governor's directive mm -hmm. and any town requirements. But um, I think opening is a, is a mistake at this point. I think that um, it's a little bit of a hasty decision that's on the board. And that um, at this point, we're putting employees and uh, patrons at risk by opening these businesses. So that is your biggest issue right now is the risk factor. What could, what, what could address that? What would, is this timing right now? Well, I, I just don't, I feel we don't really have a grasp on the gravity of the situation yet and whether this whole reopening is working as, as planned, um, and, you know, whether people are going to comply with the rules. We've got people that don't want to wear masks in, in restaurants and stores already. People that, you know, there's an at risk population out there. Yeah, I agree with you. What can the town administrator do with myself and I do to support that? I mean, I think you should talk the select board out of this, this reopening plan. Okay. That would be the, the best solution to keep everybody safe. What would be in place that would make you feel more comfortable? Uh, well, I mean, if we have to reopen, uh, just making sure that we're abiding by the governor's guidelines uh, to the letter and that we're not. Uh, Maybe we need to be a little bit more strict than what like, you know, they're, they're putting out. So if it was uh, more strict, as you said, would you feel more comfortable opening? Possibly. Okay. Good. Okay. Dan? Um, so obviously, the, uh, although I have to give the governor's guidance, I spent a lot of time with the governor's guidance as a case to school. So restaurants doesn't <laughs> but as a member of as a department head, I'm always curious about the extent of the done analysis. Of what is it we're trying to do precisely? What is the cost of inaction? 
in the cost of action. And not just cost. So what are costs, those benefits and risks associated with action, and cost benefits and risks associated with action. And I'd be curious um, if, as the town administrator, with the select board, if you've already given thought to that, about what that would be, how it would be communicated, how it would be effectively communicated, and what that communication plan would be. And I think that is definitely the end goal is whatever the consensus is today, that, that the, the, how that gets out into the community and to those restaurant groups are very important. I do see a role of schools in that. And I see you have a great way of getting that word out through um, your parents and your students. Um, you said that, can you go a little bit more specifically about the cost of inaction? What, what do you mean by inaction and cost of action? So, can you for some reason, there was a local ordinance that decided that we were going to do something, we were going to do legally allowable from what the governor is recommending. Um, that if the town were to say we are going to go strictly with what the local board of health is saying as opposed to what the governor is recommending. So there's there's also cost in terms of actual cost, human resource cost, time of doing things, and there's a cost to inaction. So if we thought about what those costs benefits and risks are. We have to be to, or we don't have exactly Do you, expressing those two things, do you have a concern one or the other? Um, no, I'm always concerned uh, about the use of data and being clear and being transparent. So being very clear about what it is that we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it. Okay, so that transparency is clearly mm -hmm. getting that message out earlier. Okay. okay. How can the town manager, town administrator, help with that? I would say to be that clear. So to be able to do something as a strategy, right? open something as a strategy, that's the strategy, what's the goal? And so uh, the goal should probably be expressed in terms of what are the benefits? <laughs> what are the benefits of the result? And then, and then the support that they decide to Okay. Great. Thank you. Paul, finance. Well, unlike my fellow department that I heard before, I'm very pleased to hear that the restaurant is funded in the open that they have made here. As uh, we all know, in the layout of the team, we're not going to be at 100% capacity even with outside the um, further downtown condition. As you know, we have about 35,000 students and associated employees that live in this area. The one thing that I've heard from the voice of the revenues that are going to be there, I'm very concerned about the impact, not only on the budget of our year this year, but also going forward to the FY21. 22 seconds to So you're happy about it based on your concerns with the revenue for sure, but also to revitalize the economy. So important. So is there a way for opening restaurants, because it seems to be getting tired of picking them up, um, to have an early opening like the supermarket city when they open? Mm -hmm. Or something that would benefit the seniors while they're That's a big question. That's an interesting suggestion. I mean, some communities have the early bird specials. Have they haven't done that because people eat all the time with the students and the <laughs> yeah, we certainly want to get the seniors out and social isolation is really having a rough, tough time. Any, your perception on how um, 
contaminants with a cup of water. I think you can advocate for special plan for seniors dying. I really like that. <laughs> you can do it. Uh, yeah, I'm the, I'm the yeah. inspector for that. Um, so my issue uh, is probably something similar to uh, the fire chief's concern about that. We're going to be, there's a lot of restaurants in town that are going to be doing inspections on places because there's interior and exterior seating. Uh, so obviously more concerned primarily on the interior department. And we just don't have the personnel to handle the amount of inspections. To ensure that the uh, egress is uh, open appropriately so we can find a lot in the parking lot and things like that. So, what I need from you is uh, you know, an assurance that you will support uh, the cost overages that are going to have on the new spot. And those cost overages would be associated to possible or the possible overage traffic or inspection. Probably some supply issues as well. So, I don't know how you can turn that manual down with the select board, especially if this isn't, you know, what it doesn't necessarily want to work. Uh, that's probably the opposite. Mm -hmm. And you're, is that from the police perspective or from, no. the, from the inspection? Perspective. <laughs> Uh, basically, uh, the guidance that's come out is allowing for expansion of time. Yeah. We're dealing with that right now. Uh, the concern about the fire department, while similar to the building inspector, is uh, these outdoor footprints that the folks are asking for are tending to impede on uh, egress of pathways for vehicle access, fire lanes, access to fire equipment, and we're just concerned that if we're being asked to be flexible with the businesses, uh, we may be borderline violating mass general law chapter 148 fire rules. And we just want to see what the position is of the town in regard to the fact that it's briefing, but you know, there may be the need to really support us on not allowing some of this. And then also with our community staffing, uh, we have to have four full time folks on uh, for the day, there is going to be a Uh, a lot of the places in the system have been in for a long time and what they're doing to pick up. And we really need to get in there and make sure that they are going to comply with all uh, building and fire regulations and get the open time to do so. We are in support of that and getting it open. Um, there's been discussions of waiving fees to support the businesses as well. And we just want to you know, make sure that everybody understands that those fees are what everybody's asking us to ensure that we're getting in this fire park and corrupting. We're, if we're waiting on it, we need to make sure that we're not going to be explained that not being here in the Right, exactly. So, I'm going to like start on what I think might be like a low hanging fruit. It may not seem that way, but with, with the inspections, um, there are, I know we've got some restrictions um, with uh, the local alcohol control those sorts of tools uh, for the layout of the outdoor city. Can any of those inspections be combined? Do you see that perhaps go wrong? Or we, do, we do do all of our inspections jointly. We do. Uh, but there's, there's a building, building code and fire regulation component, so we do have to do jointly. Um, it's not something where we send them to the building commission or the fire department to do it together. It was done at the same time to mm -hmm. not be on the services of the Sure. sure. So then it makes the cost. Do you have concerns in general as far as safety? Yes, we have them as So uh, we're just concerned, for example, we're seeing where curbside pickup is starting to end up fire rates in some of the places in the mall. So how, you know, if you have something that's part of the fire rate that's going to be a normal traffic flow, um, you know, these fire, we're all, you don't know what emergency is going to happen. And if we have, we have an issue there, or we get our ambulance there, uh, and they're going to stack up as we have 10 cars in line to pick up their clothing and old lady. Um, how are we going to make sure that we're, we're keeping, you know, keeping the law, but still trying to support the business? So looking at that, the, the guidelines, 
is there a part of that that you could apply and kind of de define um, the expectations of an area of address? Certainly when you do, when you do the application um, for the permit, they have waived having to um, make their whole stamp on it. Um, is there, could you, could you present a very clear um, expectation of what the limit would be for uh, the number of cars and more specifically things like that? I think we can. It's just that the county's understanding would be they need to look at how the liability is down. But if we're allowing this to happen within these spaces, mm -hmm. you know, if we have a vehicle that access and drives into a group of people that are now sitting in the driveway, what is it, our responsibility as the town for allowing that to happen? So then, you know, what, what can we do to prevent that? So we can certainly put a plan together and put the one to pass on. Mm -hmm. um, but just want to express our concerns. How we no, that's all cool. That's all cool. Okay. Um, Board of Health, as far as inspections are concerned, do you see that as something that has to still be reached uh, application? In my mind, it should be. Um, the challenge is going to be that we don't have any full-time staff as Board of Health. So uh, we don't have money on our budget to hire anybody either. So I don't know how you handle that. Um, the inspection needs to be done on the ensuring that people are safe, but how do you do that with no staff? Are you comfortable with um, a restaurant presenting their own corporate checklist? Yeah, I think so. Do we have that the community to at that? Uh, I mean, I guess that would be a, a good substitute since we can't be there at all of these establishments. Because I think it is a similar problem that a lot of the smaller communities are dealing with, especially the inspections. Um, I know there are some, you know, I've been able to look at other communities and what they're doing, and that is sort of what, they, what they are doing. I think the key question is to, to identify what can be flexible and what can't be flexible. And I think that's where really you're going to put it. Inspectors, what we are the black and whites, um, and certainly liability is absolutely a concern. Um, and I know there is really many of the applications that I have now um, that have been passed. It does address some of those issues. So I'm just wondering if some of those applications could be uh, adapted. I think it would be easier for you, but I would need, I would definitely need to have your input on what, what needs to be included in that. Um, I want to go back to the concern about opening um, doing this just quickly. I, I know that in, you know Patty specifically um, does rely on that revenue um, for those restaurants to come in. And I think it is that balance of trying to uh, bring that vitality back into the community, um, but, but also dealing with the opening too too quickly. Is there, what would you be the most comfortable with to have in place to be able to open for July 17th? I mean, we don't have a choice. We have to follow the governor's guidance. Mm -hmm. So uh, once we decide as a town that we want to keep things closed or make things more restrictive, I guess we just go with what the governor has uh, in place. So to be able to present this as the Board of Selectmen, um, can you just identify, just, just listening to what everybody has said, if you were to, in that place right now, if you were to, to you were me, and you were going to the Board of Selectmen and say that this is what we want in place, what would make you the most comfortable? Knowing that that is the desire of the Board of Selectmen to open up, to get the restaurants to open my job so and to I would say a clear and logical plan that lays out the problem we are solving to work. And if that's a problem with economic impact, that's also accompanied by the need to spend normalcy. We mm -hmm. say, what is the problem that we're solving to work? What happens every day that we don't move toward this? What is the cost in real terms? How do we intend on doing this? Is what we're trying to do. Here's how we intend on doing it. Here are the negotiables. Here are the non-negotiables. Yes. And here um, is the strategy 
and what the potential unintended consequences of the strategy too. I would want to know what's lurking behind the corner. So what are potential projected overtime costs? What are we talking about in terms of overtime costs, in terms of spectrum human resource capacity? What are all of those things? And what metrics are we putting in place at the front end to evaluate the extent to which our plan had its desired effect? So what are the revenue projections we'll monitor? What are the local public health metrics we will monitor? How frequently will we monitor those? And where will they be public A lot of very measurable goals. We're just at about 20 minutes, so we can wrap up the Okay. So I, the, uh, all of those comments were really helpful, and I, I'm confident that I can put some of those concerns together. Um, I do, I would like to move forward um, making a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen that is their desire to be able to reopen. Um, I would like to also know if there's anybody else who should have been at the table thinking of DPW would be another, uh, certainly, please. Um, that's me. They're going to be dealing with a lot of adverse traffic issues. Um, but that was really helpful. I do think that some of the things can be consolidated, but I would not want to move forward without your input. Again, it's really hard to do it in 20 minutes. Um, so I would like to put a draft together and send that out to you and get your feedback on that and be able to respond with that. Is that something you guys want to be comfortable with? Thank you. All right, so that is the simulation portion. <laughs> <laughs> No longer more than that. Yeah. <laughs> so now uh, we're just going to have a, uh, some interview questions for you. It could be based on something you said today. It could be based on your, your past interviews, resumes, whatever. Sure. So we'll just start off with uh, if you were hired as the next time administrator for Hadley, how would you be transparent with your employees and with the townspeople? And I do think transparency, you know, we can say it artificially how important it is, but I think it's really important, and I think it's the challenge of the town administrator is to stick by that. When you say you're going to be transparent, you need to be transparent. Um, I, I think the importance of having um, the input of all of the staff, whether it's directly or through their department head, um, is what really helps with the transparency. I think that I, have we, you know, I did it with the interview with you last time, but have we so good about it? Presenting everything, I think, um, I, I, I love that about the website. Everything is so clear. Um, and I would definitely, I would definitely continue to do that. Um, but I, it is important for me that the employees know that I'm not a mobile, um, and that it says that I'm a safe person to talk to, and that the department still feel comfortable talking with me as well. Um, from your perspective, and uh, based on the due diligence you're about having the current work today, what do you think is the single number one issue facing that work? Can we do two? Sure. <laughs> I, I think it's um, what's, what's, what's highlighted in the master plan and in the other documents that are um, available online is uh, the economic development and that balance of uh, relying on the businesses on the environmental signage and um, preserving the agricultural aspect and um, the physical characteristics of that So, who do you tell us again about your financial experience? Sure. In terms of budgets and how you develop it? Sure. So I have been the chair of our uh, finance committee for the last four years. I sit on the Association of Town Finance for the Mass Municipal Association. And so my involvement is starting in October, every Wednesday until May, we're working on that budget and presenting it for town meeting. Um, also, first in my own department, the budget department. But so our select board gets on the that I'm not on the I, I'm not on the finance committee anymore. Okay. Yeah. 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 So you had experience making budgets of that size. Uh, the what we're hearing is about forty million. Uh, the school budget is about twenty two million. 
and then it just throws in my own budget for my department. Um, our budget is about 500000 The town pays about 350000 of that, and the rest is generated through grants and sponsorships. So I'm actively involved that way. I'm a professional veteran. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> what are your thoughts on how to handle capital requests and how you pay for those requests? So I think it, I, I think a capital plan is extremely important. I think that you have to have that. I think, I think five years out, ten years, wonderful to be 15, 20, I'm not sure how it works because some communities don't have that. But I think a capital plan, I just don't think you can prepare if there is a capital plan um, rotating vehicles, police vehicles, to see different vehicles. So I think they're very important. I think uh, here you relationship plays a role in that. Some of those capital, not, obviously not the police ministers, but some of the capital, uh, capital needs that can be paid for through community preservation. Um, I, I think uh, I have a really good role model in the town of the hand. Town treasurer is just an incredible how he manages the budget and manages debt service. Um, he has a whole plan and he pays off some debt services. He doesn't, he keeps that money being getting tucked away. It's going into the capital stabilization fund for future because we're looking ahead knowing what, what, what uh, bigger projects need to be done. Um, so I think like it's that long term plan for capital to not be surprised. And I, I am a fan of. Uh, in my finance committees, I have some that disagree with me that want to keep free cash, free, free cash low, and our stabilization is low. But I'm, I'm kind of a fan of times like this. It's, it's been nice to have. So, uh, throughout the course of our conversation, from what Paul just asked, you indicated that we know a couple of different issues that are affecting capital and the strengths of the can you tell us all what your particular skill set that you bring to the table will do to help mitigate some of the weaknesses that you see that Patty has and potentially build on the strengths of this? So I think it's my comfort level with the size community and its characteristics of the community, and I won't go into the same detail that I went into um, with my narrator. What we talked about the last interview, but I do believe that my management skills, being that I really, really enjoy building relationships with people, not just with concepts or departments, but with the individuals themselves and the individuals in the community. Um, I think that that's really important for this size of community. Um, I was most comfortable in town and in the because I got to know all of the behind the scenes people. You know, these guys turned into a patriarch. But I think a management style does match towns. And I don't think you can treat or manage in a, in a town, a small, rural, agricultural town, town the same way you would be a town administrator in um, a bigger community. Say this on that or on that level. I think there's different types of management. Um, and I just feel confidently that I'm the most comfortable in the size community. So I have two parts to kind of like expand on that answer to that. Um, the first part is, is the emergency executive director for the way I uh, I have the role of dealing with emergencies that come in, these fire, uh, other events, whatever, and my job is to ensure that the chair of the select board and the select board are kept in form. Uh, and then the assistant pressure treatment is going down to the public. Uh, and to the staff. Uh, your experience as a PIO, the role of the town administrator under the government's management as a PIO, so a public information officer, getting, making sure that all the information is coming in and following it in one place. So, so put out into one consistent message. Uh, just your thoughts. So, so um, I was involved with the October 2011 storm, and it was part of the assistant team, part of the emergency team. And so we learned a lot about that. Um, I know some students call it that reverse 991, we use a different term. Um, and we also, as a council, we have our own um, costs. And so we used a couple things during that point. We did use the um, electronic sign in the center of uh, the 
lower than the sun now today. Uh, to be helpful to be aware of where the shelter was and other things like that. I think that one of the things we learned right away in that first is we had a shelter open when I was the shelter director. Um, we had open for seven days and even had to uh, discharge people to the senior center was just a few people left. The biggest thing was communication. And we developed a hotline, so people could call that hotline. It's still active today. Um, it's not now in the COVID hotline. So that people can see it in a very specific place, um, like me having the year, we use our table access a lot. So especially for the seniors who aren't going online, but they'll, they'll go on the table access station. So the, the importance of that, I, I can't even you know, say over express and that was something we learned from that. Among many other things, that one, uh, that point, that one point in the that one point to get information was crucial. Really, really good. I guess the tour is being on the small town of Field Cabin, so the 5,000 plus residents in the town, but the 40 to 80,000 people that travel from our town that work in our community daily can put a major strain on our public safety and everybody else. Um, are you prepared to be able to wear both of those hats? So be able to, uh, while keeping consistent with you know, the agricultural history of having, but then also being able to understand the, the strength and the stress that your department is a hunger to try to manage this Right, and I, I do think part of that is getting to know everybody, getting to know the department heads and what their challenges are. Specifically, because if they're not going to say from one department to another, um, certainly the seniors are consistent about that relationship growing, so they're always using that. Um, but I think I, I really, when I said it during the interview last night, it's really important that I get to know all the department heads. I've been that department head, and the person who's in charge, especially, I hate to say this, I don't think it's, it's, it's here, but when you're down in the house on the and you're that's lower on the priority list. Um, I know what it feels like like to have that time with manager or time to manager to come and talk to me and say what's going on in the department. And I just think that's so important. And it seems like a really basic thing to say as that's a solution, it's not a solution, but I have to learn what the impact is on the community. I can't even tell you I know exactly what it feels like to have only 5,000 residents and then you've got 40,000 people in the community. So, um, I just that I have to be honest about that and need to get to know everybody. So I was the superintendent before, so the superintendent, so I'm going to ask another data question. <laughs> when you think about uh, the return on investment to the taxpayers, the investment they feel in their towns in terms of their taxes. I'm having a little trouble hearing you. So when you think about return on investment, for uh, in the public sector, we think about the taxpayer and that they uh, give us their hard earned tax money we need to invest. And they expect a return on that investment. How do you think about and express return on investment qualitatively and quantitatively as a town administrator? How would you communicate that to, to the community? It's really interesting, I think, that, you, that those are the terms. Um, when you look at municipal government compared to a private sector of business, it is hard to articulate to the public what return on investment is going to be. It's certainly a quality of life. It's certainly, um, it is specifically what the community is like. It is what your school system is like. Um, and I think those are some of the measuring tools. Who's graduating? Where are they going? Are the seniors able to stay here? Is there affordable housing, which I know um, that have a taken an initiative with. Um, and can we keep people here? I think I think well, that's what I'm experiencing in other communities is people are can't stay they can't stay where they were raised because they can't afford it. And I think that's really important that we take an investment in the town um, to make sure there is housing and to make sure this is fair. If somebody's looking with their family to move to that that would be that place. Um, certainly and, and when I tell people what it takes this is 12 hours. That's a half of what we see in the end of the This on the always like 23 hours. So there's so many peculiar things here, but to be, I, I think housing is one of those issues um, that they need to see that they can, there's a place that they can afford to 
be a part of the community school district. And then as a senior perception of those first procedures. How is that? <laughs> Not real measured. <laughs> Uh, you covered the budgets with James question. Uh, how many people have you or employees have you made responsible for the past supervising? So I so right now I, I have the most that I have. I have 19 employees. Um, and that doesn't include the 60, 75 volunteers that we have as well. Um, so I have I, I have a bigger senior center because we also do a similar to that as a private program at PPTA. Um, we were the first ones to do it, and ours is regional, so I provide care transit for at least some of the long run and local uh, So that has certainly added on to my, um, uh, my staff my staff role. So I have 19, I have seven full time right now. So I have a lot of experience with that without we just got the HR support. So I have learned HR um, by error and I learned a lot. Um, but I am confident I understand and, you know, I talk to people at progressive and all of that. So it is one of the things that I really like. I, I like um, having staff and building up that team and making sure they're happy when they come to work. Because that definitely impacts the resources which are the residents. Any last questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All, right. All right, so we'll get rolling on deliberations. deliberations. And uh, again, I just, for the people watching at home, I want everybody to be clear that that was not the only questions asked of these candidates. We had a you know, right example, resume, uh, an hour interview of each candidate prior to this. So they, there's been more vetting in just those questions. I know it seems a little bit superficial, but we kind of dug into things a little bit more during our initial round of interviews. So, that's, uh, I guess, let's, let's go down the line. I mean, what are our, our thoughts? Is there anybody that, you know, strengths and weaknesses? I guess we can do strengths and weaknesses quickly for each one. Do you want to do that, or do you want to just uh, say who you, who you would like to recommend? I mean, it's like you guys. We got, we got a little bit of time. So, how about we do strengths and weaknesses real quick on each, on each candidate? Chief, Chief. I'm looking at you, so you guys start first. <laughs> Uh, let's let's start with Tom, go down the line, and then we'll do Josh and then uh, Carolyn. Do you just want strengths? Strengths and weaknesses, what you would like the best about the candidate? Uh, I, for, for Tom, I, I think he really took charge of the meeting, very, very, he spoke very well, uh, while he was in you know, the meeting, and uh, I like how we just got everything organized. Um, weaknesses, um, I really, I felt comfortable with it. I felt like, uh, you know, could have been meeting with that. Um, for Joshua, um, you know, I like that he's working for a small town, understands that kind of a dynamic. I know he's made some very changes in that community by what he's described. Um, he was also, he also was uh, appreciated the fact that long was busy and wanted to keep it to that time of minutes. I really like the time management that we had. Uh, the weaknesses is just being a little bit more, uh, I think it, I mean, not to say that he couldn't give any challenge, but I don't think he's used to quite a lot of my budget. Uh, and Caroline, uh, I think she's very well spoken. I think she definitely can handle, obviously, a very large budget, a large staff. Um, I just really liked her transparency and really wanting to get to know each individual department and to see what the challenge are for each of those departments. Uh, as far as the weakness, it's just you know, she doesn't have time administration under her belt. So I know that multitasking, it, it happens in council on aging, it happens in police and fire. Uh, just watching uh, if you look down, the number of interruptions that can happen in one day, and how, how well you can time manage, but also get all those things. That's the, that, would, that might be the only concern I have. So, Tom, um, strength is clearly his experience. Uh, he has far more than the other two candidates. Some of the things on his resume uh, that he's done in his other communities are uh, is really impressive, and I think are things that 
many of the residents can kind of get behind. Uh, I like how we handled the meeting. Uh, it was very well done. You could tell with him and Josh, they kind of drew on their experience as town administrators on how they were able to plan the meeting. Uh, knowledge of some of the things that you could do as far as CARES Act and, and things like that uh, clearly showed that you know, he knows what he's talking about. Um, I mean, weaknesses as far as today, I didn't necessarily see any. Um, but, you know, he wasn't in the, in the straight up interview that we did two weeks ago now. He wasn't the best. He um, didn't present as well as he did today. So I don't know if folks weren't privy to that. But uh, I didn't have him rank as the best interviewer. Uh, answers to some of the questions weren't kind of what I was looking for based upon what I think had the residents of like I see. Um, Josh, again, he did a great job today. As far as strengths go, he ran the meeting very well. And like I said, he, he was clearly he drew on um, his uh, experience, which you, you could almost see it happening in front of you where you felt like you may have like, stuck with a certain question and kind of almost put himself in a regular meeting and, and did it, which I thought was great. Um, I would say, as far as weaknesses, I would say the same as Mike in that. Uh, very small budget that he's uh, working with right now, so I would be a little more comfortable with somebody like uh, Tom as far as moving into the position right away and handling the finances. Uh, but, you know, I think he could handle it. Carol, uh, not as good of a job today as she did in the original interview. In the original interview, I think. Maybe some folks saw that when she was just answering the questions, she probably handled it better. And kind of like that person that we interviewed two weeks ago kind of came out with the outgoing personality and things like that. Um, when she was initially handling the meeting, I wasn't, I didn't really like it. I didn't really like how she was doing it. Because she kind of put more of it on us and, you know, we weren't really prepared for that probably. But as I sat there and, and kind of thought about it, I thought to myself, well, if this is an actual meeting, she's asking for each department head's input. And if I'm telling her a problem, she was asking for what my solution would be to that as well. And I can kind of get behind that because that's how I handle things in my department. You know, don't bring me a problem unless you have a solution as well to present it. So, while I didn't like the way she ran the meeting as much as the other two, I kind of, I started to like it after a while. I liked the way that she, she handled it. Weaknesses um, was that, uh, but also, you know, no real experience in the uh, kind of administrative world. Financial committee, a lot of, a lot of experience there, and a huge budget, which is great. Um, something that she could probably get off of the uh, as far as, the experience level of all three GSs. Okay. I started to come out. I think that he shows that he's been a town administrator for a long time. And compared to the other two, I had a sense today that he was kind of old. He wasn't looking for anything new or exciting to do. The other two candidates are hungry, is a fair word, for more information, more exciting, and more. Um, Novelty, if you will. Josh, I think, would be a fine candidate probably in two or three more years. I, I'm concerned that he works in such a small town that he only has monthly meetings with his staff. And I understand why, because they don't have other jobs, but that's, he's going to have to, that would be a big step up to have to see the demands that this town would offer him. I think he ran the meeting well, as Mike said. I think that you could see him thinking about answers. And, and he has it, you can pull it right out inside that experience. And you know, if he hasn't had the experience, he's going to look for it. Um, Carolyn, what no one said yet is that she is a self ascribed municipal junkie. She, let me just read this. 
In 2017, she received an MEA from the American International College, a certificate in local government leadership and management from the Massachusetts Municipal Association. So she is wanting to be an administrator and get out of the department of enrollment, and she has followed municipal processes. We will have the volunteer for them on their finance committee forever. And they will put their lives back in the municipality. So even though she hasn't been a town administrator, in her other roles, I think she has administrative experience <laughs> and her following of the education. I think she would be fine. All three would be fine. That's why they would be so I thought that uh, Tom did the best job with the simulation exercise. I mean, in my mind, he kind of knocked it out of the park the way he ran the meeting, the way he addressed the department heads. Uh, you know, he looked for input, but he kind of guided what we need to accomplish today and where we're going with this. Uh, the weaknesses, like, like you said, he's been doing this for a long time. And so do we want to stick with the same old, same old? Or are we looking for some fresh perspectives on things? Obviously, he has the experience and he knows how to be an administrator, so that's a, that's a problem. Um, I didn't really have any major negatives for him today, other than in the last round of interviews, I, there was a comment, a PI out there that kind of bothered me a little bit, which uh, of understanding where the message comes from for the emergency management portion of things, and that that message comes from the emergency management and select over to the PI out to distribute not just the PIL coming up, but kind of something to put in there. Um, so just that bothered me from the last return. Um, as far as Joshua, I, I like the fact that he's another experienced administrator. He, he knows, obviously, how to do the job. Um, he interviewed well both times. Um, I wasn't such a fan of the way he ran the meeting today, uh, but he did a lot better the last round of interviews, and, and he got the job done. It was just a little bit more of a loose than that. What I would like to see the structure of the meeting. Um, the negative on him, in my opinion, is a town of 1,200 with no real commercial district it doesn't really translate, unfortunately, to Hadley. Um, you know, going from a four million dollar budget to a 21 plus million dollar budget, I think is going to be a steep learning curve. But then again, David Mason's going to be here for a little while to kind of help him out on his duty. Jane mentioned in a couple of years, maybe I think he would be a, a good candidate, but I, I think maybe a stepping stone between Brantford and Abbey would be the best candidate. Um, for Carolyn, I, I wasn't a, too impressed with the, with the simulation portion of things. Um, she interviewed fantastically in my mind the last time around with the, the general interview uh, touch things that we had for her. She's very passionate. Um, obviously, like the Jane said, she's a you miss Ms. Jungum. She's all about learning processes and, and what she needs to do to do the job. Um, I'm concerned that she does not have the experience now. She has finance committee experience, but that's very different from being an administrator and being in charge of all the town employees virtually with exception of school. So, um, again, maybe something in between Hadley and, uh, and the current position she's in now would be her best bet before stepping up to a kind of industry position. I thought Tom did an excellent job on all fronts. Uh, in the interview two weeks ago, I did a great job on um, it. was uh, superb and he was sad. And, uh, I felt that it was a collaborative approach. He took us all in. Wasn't dictatorial uh, like management style, if you will, know, rather than approach. Let's all work on this together. We'll get that in two days, see what you guys come up with, and then we still get the flag that's broken there. Uh, he's, uh, he's got 15 years of experience in one community, which is very, very rare to find a town manager, town administrator, kind of like a massive So that's the mm -hmm. to the as far as uh, weaknesses, I, I can't really find any weaknesses in the at all. Going on to Josh, uh, he's a great guy. I thought he could do well too. Uh, 
I have a concern or two about, really brought up about coming from a small community. And he is, the good point is, he is a uh, town administrator current. However, he still got about two years experience in it. As all of us know, it takes a long time to learn to follow a job. It takes years and years and two years. Like, not just be able to take that as a point of view of it. And uh, very few negatives, I think, so I think the, the Josh that I consider to be negative. Uh, Carolyn, she uh, did a great job in the initial interview with Bob, because it a lot of energy. And the thing I noticed, some of the questions that were answered were not, it didn't demonstrate a depth of knowledge of the town and uh, I have to agree with Chief Mason on the way the, the uh, staff would be run on the way. It was a rather unique approach. It was a totally different style than the other two. And but my major concern, as Chairman Hill points out, is that she is not a uh, talent administrator currently. I'm happy to be a first job. One of the candidates pointed out, yes, we are a small town, however, there's many aspects of having a lot of city. And if you want to turn over the reins to somebody who has had no experience whatsoever as a town in the um, So, I saw a lot of great things in all three of the candidates, and one of the voters that no one else did uh, with. Um, I saw uh, what everyone's spoken to experience longevity in one community. That's something that's in his resume, which I think those things are public now. So longevity in one community, that speaks a great deal, particularly when you report to elected officials. That's a tough thing to pull off anywhere. Um, and uh, that he has a very specific, and it doesn't mean he didn't say that he would impose it, but he had a very specific and evidence-based approach to developing a budget. We talked about priority-based budgeting. So he has a clear process for getting one of the most important functions done that the town administrator does. Um, and although the response to the uh, return on investment question focused primarily his response focused on outputs, things like participation rates, he did refer to goals and benchmarks, so clearly understands that resource allocation is the means by which we achieve goals and measurable progress based on benchmarks. Um, his meeting, the way he facilitated it, it was clear, couldn't, none of them could pass things out, but if clearly we both talk about Josh, had they been able to, because they verbally presented us with an agenda, they said this is the goal of the meeting, this is what we're going to do, and then at the end they closed to make sure that those things had happened, either by checking or understanding or repeating. Um, so I did feel like we did a great job there. Um, and I guess I wouldn't call this a, a weakness, I would just call it a difference. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll move on to Josh's strengths, and that's where Josh's strengths, and that's where I will um, speak about that difference, which may or may not be a weakness. It's just a question of what, what the selector feels like is in the best interest of the town, ultimately. Um, so Joshua's strengths, um, I felt, again, he ran the meeting in a way that he stated the goals for the meeting, said how we were going to go through the process, um, the strategy he used to get our feedback, and then repeated back to us what he had heard and checked our understanding and told us what the next steps were. Um, I feel as though uh, a lot of his answers demonstrated, even in this interview, um, that a theme that kept coming through was he talked about the importance of uh, looking at data. I think I'm surprised that I like that. But he talked about the importance of looking at data, of looking at um, data before making a decision about um, uh, about taxes, about um, sorry, I think it's here. Yeah, to look at our strengths um, and to look at what the data says. And I'm also thinking about in our original interview for me, he had uh, the best response 
on the question of diversity, equity, and inclusion, because that was another place that he didn't, he didn't do well with subjectivity. He says they look at the data and see what's happening for your residents in terms of their experiences in the town, and you identify spaces where their experience essentially was not what, what you would hope it would be if you address that. I liked how he talked about his communication, um, that he currently does a bi-weekly, I think every other week. So weekly, he sends something out to the partner chairs, and bi-weekly, he sends something out to the town. So I like that it didn't just say communication was important, but that provided an actual strategy as he thinks that he does to facilitate um, at least one way of communication. And so then, in terms of uh, weekly, so, so a, a strength of his in terms of where his experience I think the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and Western Massachusetts, that's really beneficial experience because I believe it was James' question about the water. So he could get very specific and draw on the fact that Landford right now has a very similar problem. Here's precisely what they're doing to address this problem. And it wasn't only the water response, it was another one where he was able to speak very specifically to strategies that Landford was currently implementing. Um, and it was a problem that was similar to something that he identified in Hackett. So while his experience is far less than Tom's, the nature of his experience in many cases seemed to be like translate to record. That's not to say that Tom's experience on the Cape wouldn't. The Cape is also quite similar to Western Massachusetts. It faces a lot of similar, a lot of similar issues. Um, but I don't, I don't know. So that's a case where I say it's a distinction, right? Not necessarily a weakness. It could be that the type of experience that Josh has had is quite similar to the kind of problem solving that he would need to do here in Adam. The water issue, well, all septic, um, all kinds of funds we can access. Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, that kind of experience might be a little beneficial to have it. But it certainly is not nearly as much experience as Tom has. And he is not. Um, Supervise the same number of employees. Um, I think the budget is important to think about the size of the budget. That is important. Um, but but if, you, if you can manage if you can manage a budget well, some of those practices apply regardless of the size of the budget. For me, I, I'm a little I'm paying a little more attention to how many staff you supervise. That's yeah, that, that I would put above how large is the budget. Those two things obviously for me. And then for, so that's my distinction, I would say. Not a weakness, it just depends on what the select board sets as a priority for the town. And for Carolyn, uh, so I, I too um, was, it's not how I would run a meeting, how she facilitated the meeting. Which my meetings are great, but so it's a meeting if you talk to people who've been in my meetings. <laughs> For that reason, you should be number one. Um, it's not the way I would do it. It's similar to what she Jason said. Um, then I started thinking about the intelligence behind that approach, which is one of the, the, the a mistake I can easily make is to assume that everybody has the same understanding of the problem they're trying to solve. And that is rarely the case. And then we start pushing a solution, and somebody else is thinking, but that's not even a problem. Why are we doing that? This is a problem. So asking people to define my problem gives you a lot of information about the extent to which consensus exists among the group about what is this problem. Um, and, but I, I do wish there had been at least more of a verbal agenda, a verbal structure to the meeting. Um, and clearly, she has this is a high premium on relationships, and there is all kinds of data and organizational tradition to support, but that is extremely important. Um, obviously, in terms of experience, the most experience just in terms of straight readers, longevity, Tom, and then Josh, and then Carolyn. But I, I think that they're, they're all good things. So our, our goal is, if possible, to come up with one candidate to recommend and select one tonight. If we cannot come up with one, then obviously two. Uh, we don't just want to turn over the same three that we just interviewed. Uh, 
tonight. So, thoughts on who those two should be, or that one should be in your mind who's the, the most qualified? Who should be put forward? I would say I would be equally comfortable with Josh or Tom. Okay. I feel pretty strong about Tom. I would uh, personally be in favor of Tom as the sole recommendation. But, uh, I have really mixed feelings about Tom. It's, it's hard to, to verbalize, but I think that we wouldn't be a challenge. I think that Brendan Lars down on the cake was a much uh, more complicated and difficult community because we've had huge influxes of tourists and we've had mixed populations and we've had a huge budget and it was spread out. And in the big area, and I think I am worried that he'd be comfortable with him, he'd be confident in him, but I definitely didn't have any views of us. But he's capable, so it's a much better for me. Um, I guess what I would say is just if you're going for enthusiastic heroin, uh, obviously we would all have that out. But um, one thing that I learned throughout this process is that I, I was completely unaware of this, but apparently the town administrator's tenure average is very small. It's like a two to four years or something like that, the same, the same community. Um, I don't know if the select board members of the audience can give any insight into how, how this works with the forum and stuff, but um, Tom was, was one of the only three who actually gave kind of a benchmark amount of time that he'd be willing to give to have. And I think that was intentional uh, on his part because I think he was actually the person from the interview who told me how short of a ticket the administrators had. So I would be confident in, in Tom, uh, certainly as a singular candidate to put forward, but I would also like to know from the select board what are we aiming for as far as tenure here, um, because uh, obviously Carolyn and Josh probably offer much more of a time frame. Uh, I guess that's just feeling that Tom would say he would have probably eight years if, if, if I may, uh, see so your points well taken about the tenure managers uh, or administrators. It really depends on the select board. It depends on on the on the uh, 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 board that they're working for and uh, the chemistry. So if things are moving well, you know it, it's not unusual to stay to have a, uh, an administrator five, ten, fifteen, in this case, fifteen years. There's some communities that have had, you know, administrators 20, 25 years since they're moving along well. Uh, the, the, the chemistry is is good. So it's not unusual. Obviously, they they you know, 14, 15 years. Um, you know, that's, so it's not unusual to have uh, an administrator that length of time. However, in the negotiations, um, that would take place with any of the candidates, you can make it very clear uh, what your expectation is in terms of tenure and longevity. Now, there are actually some municipalities that have charters that say they have a term of administrator, the administrator, a term of three years or five years, something like that. I don't think you have that, but you certainly can make that expectation known in the, um, in, in the negotiation. It's not sure you're going to write it in the contract, but you certainly can say, you know, we, we need somebody here X many years. It's, it's just the way we operate. Uh, we don't want to go through this painful process again. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. So that's subject to this negotiation with the select board. Well, I want to say that it's a three-year contract. 
for the time. Yes. Re re minimum of re re renewal. Renewal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's no term limit. No, but the first contract was a two-year contract. And I won't speak to the rest of the select board, but in, in my mind, this process is time-consuming and expensive. I <laughs> had uh, So uh, we want to find somebody that, as long as they're a good fit for the town, is going to stay there. Because let's face it, everybody that we, any new administrator, is going to have different ways of doing things. There's going to be a learning curve for everybody that's been working for that administrator. And so if you have a constant turnover in that position, Employees are constantly playing catch up, trying to figure out well, how should I be doing this? What should I be doing? Um, so, in my mind, that, that, that's you know, there may be a varying perspective. Maybe to some degree, change is good too. So, yeah, yeah I mean, that's kind of why I bring it up. It's a <laughs> process that I've been involved in since I've worked here that has kind of always been a common thread. Um, that no one that's involved in the process really wants to ever do it again. <laughs> um, and I, I can recall, you know, during my hiring process, some of the folks who came to the meeting talking specifically about, hey, if you hire this guy, he's not going to He's here for the kind of the long haul. And that's what's got most of the heads nodding, um, from, from what I recall. So, I bring that up because um, if that's a number one priority, that probably changes who I would like that. Um, but it's also the person's least amount of experience. It's, it's really that sense. Um, I would have no problem with winning if someone made a motion to, to vote for Tom right now because he's confident. And he will do a good job. Whether or not he's the right fit, right I don't know. Um, but if you're looking for longevity and you're looking for, as Jay said earlier, um, I forget the word you were talking about. Municipal judgment. Municipal judgment and things like that. Uh, you know, she's, she's probably my top pick if that's what we. If that's what the top priority is, select so more. Yeah, I, um, I, I just think Tom is definitely, I'm very comfortable with that. Again, if we, if we felt that, I mean, I'm looking around the room here, if we have department heads, we have staff here that are the foundation for the town administrator as well. Uh, and I, I really think that, you know, I was a young chief coming in, Mike was a young chief with very levels of experience in management and a lot of it you're not going to work as you go. Um, and I, I personally, um, again, I like, I like Tom, but Josh, to me, uh, was very, he, he recognized the fact that he's walking into a small community that also has a big city inside of it as well. Uh, and then I also like that, you know, that Carolyn uh, really wanted to sit down and get, really get to know each one of the department head folks to make sure that they, she truly understood what our challenges were. And I, I didn't really hear that from, from Tom. And again, maybe, you know, that's his management style. Maybe it does happen, I don't know. But it, it seems to be a focus of the other two where they really wanted to, uh, you know, again, data driven, but also uh, just it's more human to me. Um, and I don't know, I, I agree with, again, I'm comfortable with all of them because you guys have three job I can three, I wish I could have heard the other agrees, but uh, I'm just, I'm looking at another level of excitement, another, another level of bring you something maybe new and fresh that maybe Tom would uh, So my, my top top candidates, uh, I mean, I know what Josh talked about top top, for sure. So do we want to, there seems to be a good mix of uh, top top candidates. So do we want to aim for maybe two, two. narrow one down? <laughs> <laughs> 
what happens, we go to the select board tonight, and four of the five select board have heard the candidates. And then that's the group that's going to ultimately decide. If we can't come up with one, that's, that's the hiring authority. May I just speak to that? I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, because ultimately this employee reports to the select board. And although there are four select board members here, they can't deliberate. This is supposed to select on meetings right. right now, correct? Right. Right. And so they have had the opportunity to hear some of this. And, I mean, so I don't, I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing. Ultimately, this is the board that selects and whom the person supports. I didn't mean it was bad. I just mean it's that process is a happen. Or would they, would they have to interview again to include the fifth select board? I, I, I don't necessarily think, I mean, it's up to the individual members that chose to come to you know, whether or not they could or whether or not they wanted to come. But I think that if, you know, if we put forward two candidates tonight, uh, we could certainly allow them to ask questions of whatever they would like, even if they were repeats of questions that were previously asked during the process. And um, they, they've had the resumes and the writing samples to look at. And so they've had, had a, a chance to research if they so choose. But, uh, let's try to get down to two since we can't come from, come from one. Huh? <laughs> well, I think just based on what the comments that all of us have been making, it sounds like it's Tom and Josh that I'm hearing from most people. And yeah. then, you know, I know there's a concern about. Um, I guess he did disclose how long he's going to stay. If he did go with one of the other candidates, there's no guarantee that they're going to stay. You know, they may have more energy or youthfulness, but I've seen situations in my career where people have selected based on that. And three years later, they use that community as a stepping stone. And another community opens up and they're gone. And here we are doing this all over again three years from now. Is that something that we all want to do for years? Not a very good fit, I don't. So I heard you saying that you would pick Tom and Josh, and I would pick Carolyn and Tom. Mm -hmm. Carolyn and Tom. How about others? Uh, Can I just ask a question? I, I, just are you guys all planning on being at the select board meeting tonight? Or the if you want to say that. I'm just wondering if we could deliberate more if we were all able to talk more than we could. I don't know. Because it's you're right, like four out of the five members are here, and even though we didn't get to ask questions, I'm sure John has thoughts on it. I have thoughts too, but I don't necessarily want to board them out there right now to buy it. Well, that's kind of why I brought it up earlier because you know I, I'm trying to I'm not I'm trying to avoid making any decisions based upon who this, this person is going to be my direct supervisor. I'm trying to make decisions based upon the right fit for the select board to work with this person to administer the town and work with all the needs here. And part of that is knowing what the priorities might not be the right word, but this is close as I can come up with what the priorities are for the select board. Being that this is the person that you are going to charge with all of your directives for the town. So, um, you know, if, if one of those priorities happens to be longevity, um, that the gut feeling that I got from, and I understand what you're saying, Paul, um, the gut feeling that I got is that I would lean a little bit more towards Aaron is. Simply because of the fact that she's been in municipal governance for 30 years, she's been in many volunteer positions with massive budgets, um, and nothing about her indicates that indicates to me that she would walk away in any short period of time. Um, and that's kind of that that would come out maybe in the back and forth between the committee and the selector. Maybe that's not right. Maybe. We're willing to do this again in seven years. 
um, or the abuse or whatever. And if that's the case, that changes my decision. Of course, I would then aim for a more level-headed person who um, is going to get us through these COVID budget cycles and then mostly off into the sunset. That's what they keep. <laughs> So if we pick two, mm -hmm. do we invite them or do we have the debate without them? No, I would, I would say bring them. I think that's a good chance to ask them questions and get a response from the candidate and also, uh, I mean. And are they present for each other's? I would, I would, I would say probably, yeah, it's a publicly posted live stream meeting, so I guess they could be watching in the hallway. Right? Buzz, what's the kind of the SOP of making that decision? Are they both in the room for that select board decision? Well, it certainly would be easier if, if you had, if you could have a select board meeting like this. You're here tonight. So you're here in the flesh tonight. Yes. I would invite them back in the flesh tonight. They're the candidates, all three of them are local, so the ones you want back. It would not be a surprise when I'd be speaking them out there, I said, you know, uh, th th there may be something going on tonight. I, I don't know how the deliberation is going to end up. So they're all on notice. Nobody said that they could not return. So we can invite them back. Personally, I'd like to see Tom and Carolyn come back. Uh, Talk about select board. That's But we need some sort of motion to do something like that. And a vote. Okay, I move that we ask Tom and Carolyn to come back and do the select board tonight. I'll second for the discussion. Okay. Any discussion on that? Uh, no, I'd like to see Tom. Josh. Yeah, I just realized that the one mistake we made is that one. Even number today. Yeah. <laughs> we'll cross that bridge about that in day one. I kept saying it's never going to happen. So I initially, I already decided I'm equally comfortable with this. I'm equally comfortable with uh, Tom and Josh. That's not to minimize all the strengths that Carolyn brought. And yeah, our vote is not saying we're not giving it with the job for, for sure. I mean, I think any of them, two or three have already shown them. There's no, no question. So. All right, so um, all those in favor of bringing back uh, any further discussion? No. All those in favor of bringing back Tom and Carolyn to tonight's select board meeting? Aye. 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 All those guys. So How many voting members do you guys have? Six. six, six, six. six. That's how it worked out. But it, so what's the majority? Is it three or four? Okay. So, so the motion is yeah. okay. so so the that, that fails that so, okay. All right. So we could do that. Mr. Chair, um, I need, I, I will vote that. Okay. I'm going to look at it. So, four, two, three. You're sure? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, in that case, the motion does carry. Um, so, we'll invite her back tonight for 5 30 for in front of our full select board. And um, if you two can be here, that would be great. So that way you can give your perspectives to the rest of the board. And then uh, Christian and John and Joyce can ask the questions tonight. And... Absolutely. Yeah. If you guys want to come, that'd be great. Sure. Yes. 530? 530. We're filling up your whole day. I'm good. 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 Yeah, yeah, perfect.
Technically, that's no, All right, so we have a motion to adjourn. Can we get a second, please? We have a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? All right.